Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Foreign Affairs Editor of Sky News, Ms. Deborah Hayes, and Defence Editor for The Economist, Mr. Shashank Joshi. much for joining us here today. We are delighted to have you here at this third iteration of NATO Engages, marking 70 years of the Alliance's history. Now, the most important thing for us today is to bear in mind this is a town hall event. This is not a crusty think tank event where we are going to bore you with panel after panel for hours on end. If that happens, just start booing and Debs and I will rescue you on the stage immediately. Yeah, as, as Shashank said, this is all about NATO engaging with a wider audience and for you, the audience, to engage with us to learn more about what NATO is and why it matters. And we're having this event as leaders arrive in London for this summit. So if they decide to engage, such as President Trump on Twitter, then we can share that with you and you can share your thoughts with us. We're going to take you through why NATO matters by looking at its past and also thinking about its future. We're going to be hearing from individuals who will be talking about key events that meant something to them, such as the invoking of Article 5 for the first time after the September 11 attacks. In terms of now, we're going to be looking at how NATO is adapting for current threats, including the Russia challenge, the challenge of great power competition, which means the, the rivalry between big global powers such as China. And we're also going to be looking at the future with NATO about to enter the space domain, NATO even thinking about climate change, and NATO also looking at disruptive technologies and asking how that changes the very nature of war. We are very grateful for all the speakers today, but we also know we have a very accomplished audience, uh, uh, equally talented in your own fields as anyone here on the stage, and we're particularly grateful to have non-traditional security voices, the sorts of people who may not focus day in, day out on the bread and butter of NATO issues. But first, we'd like to thank our consortium partners, uh, those who have helped organise this event today. The Atlantic Council, Globsec, King's College London, the Munich Security Conference, and the Royal United Services Institute. We'd also like to thank our institutional partners. There is a long list of them, but it's important that they all get a mention. So they're the British International Studies Association, the Brookings Institution, the Coalition for Prosperity, Elcano, the European Council on Foreign Relations, the German Marshall Fund, Global Focus, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, the International Centre for Defence and Security, bear with me, Jagello 2000, the Lennart Mary Conference, LSE Ideas, the New Strategy Centre, the Polish Institute of International Affairs, RAND Europe, nearly finished, Foundation for Political, Economic and Social Research, and Women in International Security. And that's all we have time for today. Thank you. Uh, okay, sorry. I will also thank our media partners who are bringing this event to a, the wider audience, the wider world. That's Defence News, NBC News, and Wired UK. And I thank our sponsors who've made all this possible BAE Systems, Improbable, who we'll be hearing from later in the day, General Atomics, and the German Federal Foreign Office. Now, why did you want to come here today? It's to listen to a really exciting lineup of speakers. We've got heads of state and government, we've got ministers, we've got military chiefs, and we've even got a superstar Afghan singer. What we're really keen on is active audience engagement today um, as we tackle these issues. We'll have a number of formats. We'll have small town hall type discussions, but we'll also have uh, spotlights on particular specialist issues by, by experts and, and, and specialist speakers. And we'll have storytelling sessions where people talk about how NATO has affected them in very personal ways over the years. This whole event is being live streamed, so if a camera points in your direction, give it a wave to people back home. And you can also engage by using social media, Twitter or Facebook. It's hashtag NATO Engage. That means you Russian trolls as well. And really importantly, if you haven't done this already, can you please pick up your mobile phone? I've done this, and I'm useless with technology, so you can all do it. If you look in your app store, you can find the NATO Engages app. 
If you can download that, this is the way for you, not only by sticking up your hand and asking questions, but for you to be able to engage with our panellists and our speakers, and also for them to engage with you by posing questions to you for you to answer. All right, we're going to warm you up, so please open the app. We'll actually test whether you've done this now. If you followed instructions well, open the app up. We have a couple of uh, vitally important questions for you to test how this works. There's a lot of people looking at their phones. This is positive. Yep, okay, all right. Uh, and could we please have the first question up on the screen, please? And if not, you'll see it on the app. <laughs> okay, I'll read it out to you. What's the best part about being here in London? I'm going to give you a few seconds to reply. We're not seeing it on the screen, but we've given you a few options. Uh, it's a multiple choice question. What's the best part about being here in London? Is it the tea? Is it the rain? Is it delays on the Piccadilly line? Is it the NATO leaders meeting? We're not seeing it on the screen, but I'm trusting that the technology is doing its work uh, and generating results for us as we speak. And if we're not getting them now, we'll get the results a little bit later. Uh, I'm sure you're all itching to hear how we feel about the capital. We also have another question for you. Uh, in recent weeks, there has been... Uh, none of you will have missed the pretty vigorous public debate from different member states about the strategic future of the alliance. What should it focus on? What should, where, where should its priorities lie? Has it allocated resources uh, uh, in accordance with the challenges it faces? So we'd like to get your view on this at the beginning of the day, and we'll see how this changes. Uh, could you tell us, please, in your opinion, what should NATO's main focus be in the future? Should it be deterrence against major power competitors? Should it be countering terrorism? Should it be securing stability in conflict situations around the world? Securing democratic and liberal values against other state models? Or all of the above? And you should be able to see those options on your phone now. So please vote. We'll give you a few seconds uh, and we will come back to the results uh, and I will, I will tell you uh, how this room breaks down and we will, no doubt the Secretary General later on will be paying very close attention uh, to your strategic guidance to him. Thank you, Shashank. I hope that was clear. So that's enough of the housekeeping and the explanations. We want to get on with business. And I'd like to welcome on stage the chair of our first session. She is the Vice President of King's College London, Ms. Funmi Olani Shakin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a real privilege to be here today to participate in this important NATO Engages event on innovating the alliance. We at King's are incredibly proud to be one of the five consortium partners responsible for putting together today's proceedings. We have many King's students volunteering on the ground today. A particular thanks to them for helping to make this such a memorable day. I am hugely encouraged to see such a, young, such a, a strong turnout of young people in the audience from many of the Alliance's uh, member countries. It will be you, uh, the next generation, that will have to live over the longer term with many of the decisions taken in the NATO context in the months and years to come. It is essential that your voices are heard, so you make your own distinct contributions to the discussions and debates so vital to shaping the future of the Alliance. This week is tinged with sadness for us at King's. On Saturday, our beloved colleague, Professor Sir Michael Howard, MC, sadly passed away. In founding the Department of War Studies uh, almost 60 years ago, and I'm a student uh, of war studies as well. So Michael established King's as the go-to place for the study of war and conflict in its various forms. In this session, we're going to hear perspectives on innovating the Alliance from the right Honorable Ben Wallace, 
who was appointed Secretary of State for Defense on 24th July. Ben Wallace has a military background as an officer in the Scots Guards, seen service in Northern Ireland, Germany, Cyprus, and Central America, and been mentioned in dispatches in 1992. Ben Wallace's parliamentary and government career have seen him in many important roles. Most significantly for today's event, before becoming Defense Secretary, Ben Wallace was Minister of State for Security at the Home Office in the UK's Interior Ministry. Security is not an abstract concept for many young people, even in NATO member states like Britain, and Mr. Wallace was in that role during the terror attacks of 2017 and the Russian state attack in Salisbury in 2018. He oversaw the response to the terrorist attack on the Manchester Arena in 2017, which deliberately targeted young people attending a concert, killing 22 and injuring hundreds, and with victims as young as eight years old. He's therefore an ideal person to open an event about today's challenges and the future of NATO. It is my great pleasure to welcome the Secretary of State for Defense to NATO Engages, and I now hand over the floor uh, to him. Many thanks. Um, uh, we have a good NATO weather forecast today. It's uh, nice and sunny, so uh, don't believe the hype about London being rainy in December. We can fix a lot of things in the Alliance, and the weather is one of them. Uh, and I'm happy to spread that fake news uh, as I go. It's also great to see such a diverse audience in the room, because we don't just have NATO officials and think tanks here, but students from across the Alliance. I understand from 70 countries, 70 countries for 70 years. Today's leaders you're going to hear from, and perhaps tomorrow's leaders are sitting here in the room. And it's fitting that this conference isn't simply about reflecting on NATO's first 70 years. It's also about how NATO can contribute to make the world safe for another seven decades, and how we can adapt to the new challenges facing us from cyber threats to climate security. Historians of NATO know that our alliance has always risen, risen to whatever challenges has been thrown at it. After the carnage and slaughter of the Second World War, 12 nations came together to guarantee one another's security, protect our freedoms, and keep the peace in Europe. We came together to defend our common values, and that most noblest of calls, to defend those that cannot defend themselves. That purpose is as true today as it was then. Our alliance held true to that mission through the long winter of the Cold War. Then, when the Berlin Wall fell some 30 years ago, NATO was instrumental in safeguarding the peace and stability of a continent in flux, turning former adversaries into allies by holding out the hands of friendship and freedom across the continent of Europe. And when the world changed again on September the 11th, 2001, NATO stepped up once more Invoking, invoking Article 5 for the first time as we all stood together in support of our US allies and in solidarity against the scourge of terrorism. Since the events of 2014 and Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea, we have adapted again to reinvigorate our deterrence and our defence with enhanced forward presence, rapid reaction and higher readiness. Today our alliance is not just standing sentinel on the borders of Eastern Europe, it is reaching across continents, and we have more than doubled in size to some 29 countries, soon to be 30, and each of us remains bound by the common values of that founding treaty, freedom, democracy, human rights and the rule of law. To those that doubt the potency of NATO, you should ask yourself why, if an organisation is without purpose, do our adversaries put so much effort into stabilising our alliance? But today we face new challenges, and keeping with our best traditions, we must continue to adapt. Traditional warfare has changed. The threats are no longer only conventional, no longer only overt. Our adversaries are striking from the shadows. 
They are pursuing new tactics to divide and destabilise, exploiting new technologies to exacerbate the uncertainties of an uncertain world and to undermine our way of life. Six years ago, the Russian Chief of the General Staff, Valery Gerasimov, wrote that the rules of law has changed as the role of non-military means in achieving political and strategic goals have grown, he said that long-distance, contactless actions against the enemy were becoming the main means of achieving combat and operational goals. With social media, cyber and more open societies giving our competitors unparalleled opportunities to achieve their aims, the Gerasimov Doctrine is here to stay. And hybrid warfare is our new reality. It is constant and challenging to all our aims. Our allies in the Baltics and our partners in Ukraine and Georgia are only too familiar with such tactics. But this is happening right across our alliance. It's happening here in Britain. Before taking up this post, as Fumi said, I was the UK Security Minister for over three years. I got to see into the shadows and see the daily attacks on our societies that many do not. Cyber attacks, disinformation, assassination, corruption, all prosecuted on our open and liberal societies. The urgent question is therefore, how can we individually, but as importantly, collectively respond? I believe that the answer is threefold. It starts with investment. Investment in both our conventional forces, which are so important to effective deterrence, and in those new capabilities needed to address the challenges that lie ahead. In this contact, I welcome the news that Canadian and European allies will be increasing their defence investment by $400 billion by 2024, which represents significant progress towards our shared pledge to spend 2% of GDP on defence, though there is, of course, still more to do. And I'm proud that the United Kingdom has been taking a lead in NATO. Not only have we consistently spent 2% of our GDP on defence, but we are the first ally to offer our offensive cyber capabilities to the Alliance. Today, British service men and women are standing shoulder to shoulder with NATO allies, including 1,000 British troops leading enhanced forward presence in Estonia and supporting it in Poland, as well as similar number in Afghanistan, developing Afghan leadership and counter-terrorism capabilities as part of NATO's resolute support mission. Next, as the title of this conference reminds us, it's about innovation. NATO is now looking at the ways in which new and emerging technologies will continue to change the threat landscape, from hypersonic missiles that reduce our decision-making time in the face of an attack, to quantum computing, potentially rendering current encryption obsolete. We must understand that these challenges are what we face today, and we must adapt to them accordingly. And we must be consistently be on the hunt for the next geopolitical disruptors, such as demographic shifts or climate change, or the next technological advancement that changes the rules of the game completely. Maintaining our technological edge is the only way we can avoid obsolescence and deliver on our most important pledge, keeping our people safe. I'm pleased to say that when our leaders meet tomorrow, they will recognise the progress that NATO has made in adapting to the new, these new challenges, agreeing a plan for NATO's response to emerging and disruptive technologies, recognising two new operational domains in space and cyberspace, and developing plans to confront and deter hybrid tactics of the kind I've been speaking about. But strong those achievements are, there's always more to do. While the Alliance is faster, fitter and fairer than it has ever been, we will have to keep changing, keep adapting to tomorrow's challenges. And finally, it comes down to solidarity. Our comparative advantage over our competitors has always hinged on our togetherness, our unity. We are a civilian-led alliance of democratic states. That is not a weakness, that's our greatest strength. And while differences of opinion are normal in any democratic organisation like ours, we ultimately succeed because each of us trusts that the other will have their back. Our joint commitment to Article 5 is the cornerstone of our solidarity. It is the cheapest form of defence. But you can't have that without engagement. And that's why we're all here today. NATO needs your insight, your challenge, your new leadership, 
to provide the same level of protection and security to future generations as it did to our forebears. As security minister, I always used to say that security is not a competition, it is a partnership. That incredible partnership has protected our nation for 70 years, and as long as we keep our solidarity, staying true to our values, our guiding light, then NATO will remain the greatest defensive alliance the world has ever seen, and continue keeping our people safe for many years to come. 70 years ago, at the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty in Washington, the US President at the time, Harry S. Truman, said, men with courage and vision can still determine their own destiny. They can choose slavery or freedom, war or peace. His words on that day are as true now as they ever were. We must stand together, no side deals, no separate voices. Our adversaries strive for that division. They fund that division and target that division but we will not let them succeed. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council, Mr. Damon Wilson. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to NATO Engages. I want to thank the Right Honorable Ben Wallace, our hosts, the Her Majesty's Government, uh, for helping to set the scene with that, those set of opening remarks. You heard from the Minister a strong commitment of, to the Alliance, a sense of how NATO has safeguarded our communities, our populations over the past 70 years, but how it remains focused today on its transformation for the future. You heard the Minister just say, no side deals, no separate voices. This is meant to be the 70th anniversary leaders meeting, a capstone to a year of celebrating NATO's 70th anniversary. It was meant to be after Brexit. And yet here we are in the midst of a British election. Brexit still plays out. Leaders are gathering in the wake of acrimony over Syria. Strong words from President Macron challenging the, his peers with sharp rebukes from some other NATO leaders. Many of you, many NATO officials today are holding their breath watching Donald Trump's Twitter account to see what he might say. But beneath all this noise, part of what we want to unpack today at NATO Engages, beneath the noise, things are happening. And that's the conversation we want to have today about how NATO is preparing for its future. We're going to watch this leaders meeting unfold over the next 24 hours in really three big areas. One, about the unity and solidarity of the alliance despite that noise. And you're going to see that come through in a big deal on common funding, on progress on sharing the burden within the alliance. You'll see the family expand as they welcome North Macedonia, Prime Minister Zayev, to the table. But you're also going to hear more, as the Defense Secretary said, about NATO's transformation, about its capabilities. It's not just money, it's for what? With more forces in the East, the Baltic, and the Black Sea, and I think we're going to see some of the strongest language we've ever seen alliance leaders used about the challenge faced from Russia. But the last point the Defense Secretary laid out, perhaps the most important to inform our conversations today, is about the future, about how this alliance adapts. We will see alliance leaders take up China, perhaps the first time in a summit declaration, a summit statement, we'll hear about China. You've heard that space and cyber introduced as new domains as NATO focuses on the future and will focus today on technology and how that impacts the security environment. And finally, climate as well is something all of our leaders are recognizing as an urgent issue. We're going to begin this debate with a terrific conversation with some terrific friends, colleagues, panelists on what's NATO's role in an insecure world, adapting to an era of great power competition. So I want to invite to the stage to the panelists who will help us kick this off, Thomas Valisak, the director of Carnegie Europe, Corey Shockey, deputy director general of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, Thomas Gomard the, of the Institut Francais de Relations Internationales et Free, and Gunnar Ibet, senior advisor to the president of Turkey on Foreign Policy. Welcome. It's a pleasure, pleasure to have you with us. Yes, 
strange. <laughs> We're going to use this session to set the scene, to get into some of the issues that we've heard from the Secretary of Defense. But I also want to use it to put this conversation in the context of the real world, what's happening right now. And I want to start with you, Gilnero, if I may. Share with us a little bit of the view from Ankara, the view from Turkey on the alliance. President Erdogan has spoken out quite strongly in reaction to President Macron's statements in the past few days. Many have raised questions about what kind of relationship Turkey is building with Russia through mill-to-mill ties on the S-400. There's acrimony within the alliance on the approach to Syria. And yet, President Erdogan came forward to say that Turkey is the most important, strongest member of the alliance in that retort. So give us a perspective from Ankara to help us understand how President Erdogan is coming into this leaders' meeting. Thank you, David. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I want to start a little bit about posing some questions. Ten, about one, two. The question surrounding this summit is not so much about the role of NATO in an insecure world, but how NATO stays together, I think, in an insecure world, which is a very fundamental uh, question. Now, NATO has never been shy or short of trying to adapt itself, and it did this very remarkably in the 1990s, which was great. But the problem is the 1990s are over. And I think this is one of the things we need to digest. So all of this uh, triumph of absorbing the post-communist states through uh, projecting stability, enlargement, partnership programs waned with new challenges, such as the rise of Russia and China, uh, the alteration of trade routes with new initiatives like Belt and Road, cyber attacks, hybrid warfare. Technology transcended our traditional understanding of boundaries. And when we add to that the growing geopolitical instability, particularly in the Middle East, that's left fragmented states and the greatest refugee crisis of our time, amidst all these geopolitical stages, uh, changes, we also have an essential ideological battle within the West between those who would like to preserve an international liberal order and those who prefer an inward-looking protectionist policies. Now, that's a pretty long list of how much the world has changed. So I, I suppose leading on from that is a question, why is NATO still facing this new world with the tools of the 1990s? And in the midst of all this change, the biggest challenge, I think, for NATO is that allies are beginning to have different security priorities. Today, one of NATO's allies, Turkey, faces a dire national security threat from terrorist attacks. These are augmented, planned, supported, and trained from across our border from Syria. It's a 915-kilometer border, and it's NATO's border. But NATO allies, unfortunately, have failed to understand this existential threat of the YPG to Turkey. Just in this last operation, we have closed off over 460 tunnels that lead from Syria into our country. These tunnels augment and support terrorist attacks that kill Turkish civilians, Turkish armed forces. These are the armed forces of NATO. So if NATO members do not acknowledge this existential threat to Turkey, I think this will undermine NATO. But Turkey does not question NATO's foundation or its purpose. It questions the alliance's understanding of Turkey's national security threats. And it believes that we should engage in a realistic and frank dialogue about this. It's about time. We do not question the validity of Article 5. On the contrary, we expect it to be fulfilled. A NATO that is fit for purpose would acknowledge this existential threat to Turkey. And this would actually make NATO stronger, not weaker. As I mentioned, we have a very long list of challenges. Isn't it better that we start working together to address them? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Gunnar. Let me pick up on this. You mentioned a battle, an ideological battle, even within the West. Thomas, let me turn to you. Um, you're here after President Macron has sort of set the terms for a little <laughs> bit of the debate over the next 24 hours. Uh, in a way that he was trying to challenge Europe to be a more geopolitical, geostrategic player. 
by shaking up his peers with the brain dead comments, uh, as everyone's familiar with. Um, can you unpack a little bit what you see as French strategy coming uh, into NATO, into this leaders' meeting? Sure. If you allow me, I will stand up because Please. this chair is a sort of instrument of torture, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so I prefer to stand up. And, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to throw the French off balance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's a bit difficult for nowadays to be a think tanker in France because our president is much more provocative than all the think, think tankers, you know. <laughs> you stole your thumb. So now my job is certainly to be more balanced. So we are in a completely reversed situation. Now, more seriously, um, what has been said by uh, President Macron is obviously very serious. And I think that uh, what is um, expected is to have a real uh, strategic dialogue, a, a real strategic discussion, and not to continue as if everything was okay. For sure, it's not the case. And that it was said rightly, for instance, the, uh, the assessment made by Turkey is very important. Uh, there is also the different assessment of Russia. There is also the different assessment regarding the future of the transatlantic relations, for instance. So let me focus on the transatlantic relation because I do believe that NATO is the key element for the future of the transatlantic relation. The thing is that North Atlantic is less important in strategic terms than it was previously. There is a shift of the center of gravity towards North uh, Atlantic to the uh, east of Asia. That's a fact. We should adapt to that. It's a real concern, namely for, for Europeans which will be much more in a periphery, peripheral situation than the U.S. in the next uh, decade. So that leads me to see that if NATO should be yes, useful, and I do believe it will be uh, useful in the next decade, it is precisely, you know, to contribute to the future of the transatlantic relation, which is at the, uh, at the time being in danger, because the, the other part of the transatlantic relation, it is the EU, which is more and more often blamed by the U.S. in terms of trade policy, for instance. So I do think that the future of NATO is certainly to try to improve the relation with the EU, precisely to contribute to the future of the transatlantic relations. So I stop there on that, but I do think that, you know, uh, what, what has been said many times by President Macron is just to avoid Europe to be sandwiched in the next decade between the US and China. So let me turn to Corey. We've just heard, you know, President Erdogan's challenging the status quo. President Macron's challenging the status quo. Perhaps no one more is trying to challenge the status quo than President Donald Trump. How do you see the United States, which has been so focused on this issue of burden sharing, but in a way that has produced questions about America's commitment in the alliance? Now that this is not President Trump's first NATO engagement, how do you see the U.S. approach to this evolving? Well, I was super sympathetic to Tomas's problem of the president being so provocative <laughs> that it doesn't leave space for anybody else. Is less <laughs> but Corey, president, we've known you long enough to know you can be provocative. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Uh, president Trump is particularly uh, ungracious in how he engages the burden-sharing argument, but he's not wrong. And he's not alone among Americans questioning why our closest friends in the world aren't doing, contributing more to our common defense. That's a very widespread view in the United States. And what's wonderful about the NATO alliance is that under Secretary General Stoltenberg's leadership, NATO allies have responded to that, right? The, the challenge for a collective of free states is winning the argument, right? Because we all have to agree to, in order to move ahead together. And NATO allies have responded really positively, even when asked so rudely and so demandingly by President Trump. So on behalf of my fellow Americans, can I just say thank you, my friends, for being so generous to us in a difficult time? because that's actually what NATO's done really well for 70 years. We, all of us, have important differences with each other, but the fundamental bargain of the NATO alliance is that each of our countries feels safer cooperating together to protect ourselves. 
That's the basic bargain, and I still think it's extraordinarily robust. So perhaps, um, interestingly enough, perhaps no longer new, but the newer members of the alliance perhaps today are the status quo members. Tomas, um, you're sitting in Brussels. You come from Slovakia. Give us a little bit of the perspective of how this is seen from Central Europe in the context of our conversation. In an insecure world, our allies in the East are those that have felt the most insecure because of Vladimir Putin's actions. How has the alliance, in your view, adapted to the concerns and interests of Central Europe uh, in transforming its ability to deter and defend against uh, a revanchist Russia? Great question, Damon, and thanks, everyone, for coming and taking the time. Good to be here. Uh, so far, so good, Damon, is the short answer, in a sense that the response after the 2014 Russian aggression to Ukraine has been appreciated. The deployment of the four battle groups in the three Baltic countries and Poland does make a difference. But there's also a newfound concern. I mean, some of it is, of course, about the U.S. commitment to NATO. Uh, I agree fully with Corey. The border sharing debate is as old as the alliance itself. You can read the books on NATO history. You'll find echoes of it even before NATO started. They were uh, from 19, for, uh, late 1940s. Um, but there's something new in President Trump's tone, um, a, a sense that, the, uh, that he brings a zero-sum approach to international relations, which does make us worry in, in Central Europe. And more... Recently, confusion, going back to what Thomas said earlier, confusion more than anything else about French ideas and French policies, particularly with regard to Russia. Now, let me dwell a little bit on this last point. There is no so reflexive insistence on things always remaining the way they are. Uh, there is, I think, opening towards debating what better sort of living arrangement one can reach with Russia. I guess we're a bit more... Um, um, we have lower expectations, perhaps, than France of what might be achieved in terms of uh, improved European-Russian uh, conversation or European-Russian security architecture. But where the really, is the, where the really main confusion lies is how exactly, what exactly is President Macron's plan for engaging the Central European allies, countries that have tried really hard in Central Europe, countries like Estonia, which have troops in Mali, not just Estonia, the Czech Republic and Romania too, that have tried really hard to put themselves in, in, in the shoes of France and of Paris and to understand the French concerns and the French view of the world are finding that there is little compensation, if you will, little, little so quid pro quo. When President Macron did give the speech on, on, uh, on uh, more recently to The Economist, the interview in which he mentioned the need for resetting uh, relations with Russia, he cited President Orban, or Prime Minister Orban, as the example of who is the so good Central European, somebody who understands his point of view. So uh, let me end with this confusion about how exactly you, you agree with the French, an opening perhaps to, again, exploring better relationship with Russia as well as a better, bigger role for the European Union and Europe writ large in security matters, but a confusion about what exactly President Macron wants. So it's a bit ironic that NATO has come together to begin transforming itself because of the challenge from Russia, and we see a far more vigorous alliance than we've seen deploying in the east because of the challenge from Russia, and that if you've just pointed out President Macron perhaps suggesting a reset with Russia. I want you to speak to that. Explain, Thomas, how France sees Russia. President Erdogan doing military relationships, raising questions about the relationship with Russia. And President Trump uh, perhaps unwilling sometimes to call out Russia for its <laughs> actions. So help, help me understand this, that the alliance has transformed more than it has in, in, in decades because of a Russian challenge, and yet three key countries are raising questions. Thomas, what is Macron trying to do? Well, that's a very important issue, and I will try to clarify the, the, this confusion. First of all, and it's not to be provocative, but I think we should not portray France as a pro-Russian country. France within NATO didn't buy Russian weapons, so it will be also a question, you know, on, on this side. Very first point. Second, um, I think we should be back, you know, uh, to the um, situation in Ukraine. In fact, many critiques can be made, you know, about what was done with the Normandy formats. But to a, a certain point, it stops the escalation from my point of view. So we'll, we'll have the next meeting, you know, 9th of December. And I think it's positive for all of us in terms of uh, stabilizing, you know, European security. Third, 
I think that what is said, you know, by President Macron should be also understood in the overall context. Yes, he said rapprochement with Russia because he does believe that it's a very, um, how to say, tricky situation in which we have today less contacts with Russia than during the Cold War with the, with the USSR. There are less working uh, channels at the time being. And that's a paradox, you know, because the situation is completely different from the one uh, during the, the, the end of the, of, of the Cold War. So that leads me to the overall, you know, vision of President Macron was to say, yes, rapprochement with Russia without being naive. He said all the time, you know, in his discourse, we know pretty well the Russian regime, believe me, because there was uh, interference, you know, during our election, like uh, in the US and so on. I can elaborate on that. But you had this rapprochement and you have also another thing which is very important and which has not been underlined in my view, which is also the Indo-Pacific strategy. That leads to the concern, which is, to some extent, addition with rapprochement with Russia plus Indo-Pacific strategy leads to China, which is maybe a way also to have um, a real discussion with the U.S. So I'm going to pick up the China theme in just a minute, but let me play out Russia first. So President Macron and President Erdogan have had a little bit of a public spat coming to the summit, and yet we're hearing that perhaps both of them are pursuing in their own ways some kind of rapprochement with Russia. Turkey has bought weapons, the S-400. Gulnar, what is, what is President Erdogan trying to do with Turkey, Russia? Turkey, well, I mean, I think there are two separate issues. Turkey's relationship with Russia is largely a compartmentalized relationship. You know, when it's a pragmatic compartmentalized relationship. Areas where we do agree on, where we can cooperate, we do. Things we disagree on, we leave them outside the door when we have to cooperate. And this is a necessity because we're very close to each other. We're sort of uh, reliant on each other in the energy trade as well, supply and consumption. And uh, we've got the Russian, the Turkish stream project as well. So there's lots of uh, issues there that bind us together and compel us to cooperate. But like I said, it's a very compartmentalized relationship. Now, the S-400 is a separate issue because it's really a requirement. We have a military requirement for our own air and missile defense, which we've had on the table since the 1990s. And we did try to purchase it through other means. We asked for the Patriot about 10 years ago. The United States didn't give it to us. We looked at other avenues. And uh, we settled for the S-400 because it fulfills this gap in our, def in our defense systems for the time being, but it's not the end of the road. So we want to develop our own air and missile defense system, which we will do, but further down the road, we'll still look at other options. So it's not, you know, it doesn't end with this, but uh, as NATO Secretary General has said, Jens Stoltenberg has said, that this is actually an issue, it's a bilateral issue between the United States and Turkey because of the U.S. concerns about the F-35 program. And now we've set up a technical committee to look into this and to allay the concerns of the United States. It is not a NATO issue. This is a standalone system. And Jens Stoltenberg himself has said, you know, NATO cannot interfere in the procurement choices of their allies. So that's uh, basically, you know. Gunnar, I saw Corey shaking her head during your, <laughs> your comments. Corey, Russia, Turkey, Congress and the White House aren't exactly reacting on the same page. <laughs> Congress has been quite outspoken about its concern on Russia, potential for sanctions, and now you're hearing voices raise these concerns about sanctions. Should Turkey even be a NATO ally is actually a conversation in our, our Congress. That's not really where President Trump's voice has been on this. How is this dynamic, how is the United States approaching this dynamic, handling Russia and allies that want relationships with Russia? Uh, so the fundamental thing to understand about the American government is that it was built by people who distrust government. Hmm. And so all of the various checks and balances, it's very easy to think that the president of the United States is the only important voice, but that's actually not true. The courts are an equal voice. The Congress is an equal voice. States balance the federal government. Uh, we're a big argument in the United States, and that fits who we are as a political culture. And so, for example, um, I find the president's attitude about Russia genuinely shocking, and so do the intelligence agencies of the United States government. But the president is disinclined to share their view of Russia's interference in our elections, of the threat Russia poses for us, 
And so what you see uh, is the Congress taking action to counter the president's decisions. Because in the United States government, like in the alliance, you always have to win the argument. And the president of the United States hasn't won the argument with the American people or the American Congress about Russia. So when the new Congress was seated in January of 2019, one of the first legislative actions they took was denying the president of the United States money to remove any American troops from Europe because they didn't trust the president's judgment on NATO and on Russia. Uh, so we're a big mess, we're a big argument, but it's important to understand how strong the counterbalancing forces are from an American public that likes our allies, that's worried about a Russia that would invade uh, Ukraine and take Crimea and change borders in Europe by violence. So one of the things that we have seen agreement within the alliance, within Congress and the Senate, is to welcome our 30th uh, ally into the alliance. I'm delighted to welcome our North Ma the Macedonian delegation. Uh, we're delighted to have you all as allies and to be part of the conversation. We're looking forward to having Prime Minister Zayev with us. Welcome. Welcome to the family. You'll see that once you join the family, it's like any family, we've got a lot of disputes within them. And, and I want to turn back. One of the reasons I referred to uh, North Macedonia um, is that folks have begun to notice that China has started to be present in Europe, has started to play an interesting role in the Western Balkans and Central Europe in particular, uh, across Europe. And we're going to see a leaders meeting that probably for the first time has a more structured conversation about what China is. We may see a statement that comes out that for the first time will refer to China, underscoring that this is where it's being an issue for the alliance. It doesn't mean there's a common approach yet. And so I want to ask this last question, then I'm going to turn to the audience. So get your questions ready. China, you sat around the NAC table, but you've also been in Central Europe. And many have been worried that has China been using Central Europe, the Western Balkans, the soft underbelly, to create a hold in, in, in Europe that will at some point, I think as you said, Toma, force Europe to hedge between the EU and the United States. Brilliant. Before I get to that, Damon, let me add my congratulations to North Macedonia. Slovakia was among the, uh, the biggest supporters of enlargement because we lived through the transformative effect enlargement or accession has had on our country and society. And, and I'm delighted that the alliance and the allies have been able to continue extend it, uh, that effect uh, further uh, south, uh, southeast. So congratulations. Um, on to China. Uh, the existence of the 17 plus 1, for those of you in the room who don't know, that's the special format sort of agreement that Central European, many Central European countries and, and countries of West Balkans have with Beijing, that has obscured the reality of, of real divisions among Central Europeans on China. Now, the 17 plus 1 is, is, is sort of a political umbrella uh, which produces an annual statement to which I wouldn't attach much significance. The reality of it is the Central Europeans are essentially a good microcosm of the na broader NATO divisions uh, on China itself. You have countries within, in fact, divisions within the countries. You have within the Czech Republic, for example, national security establishment that is sharply laser focused on the consequences of Chinese investments into things like 5G, whatnot, and actually producing some of the best analysis among NATO countries on the potential consequences of being too naive about allowing uh, China to dominate our, the next uh, generation of IT. And you have even within the same country some of the best examples of how if you're soft on corruption, if you are soft on checks and balances, if you, are if you are soft on the powers of a judiciary, you allow not just China, but Russia and other nefarious actors to weaken your own ability to defend your own interests. The reality is China, much as Russia, isn't necessarily creating dependencies or creating vulnerabilities. They are praying, they are, they are, they are in, in, in many ways taking advantage of our own failures within Central Europe just as much as, as in broader Europe, again, to clean up the judicial systems, uh, to clean up the political act, to clean up things such as campaign financing. The best response to China and Russia in many ways isn't to get more alert and more paranoid about China and Russia, it's to take a look inwards fix the, the, uh, the weaknesses, vulnerabilities within our systems, because that is what allows China and Russia to have the undue influence on the politics they've had in some Central European countries lately. 
Thank you. So our Tom nice. Tomas talks about China and Russia together. Tomas used China as a rationale for why Macron might be talking a little bit differently about Russia. How does that divergence in strategy play out, Tomas? Well, Europeans continue to believe in free trade. They are against protectionism. Okay? So the, the real issue at the timing is with the U.S. on that, plus with China and its attitude in investing, you know, uh, in, in Europe. There is no possible um, free trade without, you know, maritimization. So for me, when I am thinking about China from a European point of view, it is to say, oh, we do think simultaneously about the future of the trade and the sea power. Problem is that, you know, many uh, European countries don't understand that there is a world east of Suez. But I think that it's very important in strategic terms to try to explain to uh, other Europeans, especially to Germany, that it's very important to take Indo-Pacific into consideration if we do want to continue to have an open trade system. On a more, you know, a naval point of view, we have observed that the Chinese are more and more present, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea, also in the Baltic Sea. So that's something on which we should um, think gently. But my point on China is much more, you know, related to the sea power than to think about, you know, Russia and China jointly. It was said, it was, sorry, down by the U.S. Uh, and, since, sorry, 2005, approximately. At that time, I must say, I was very skeptical. It was said in a, in a, in a statement made by President Bush. Now, what is interesting, it is the, the growing imbalance between China and Russia, which is very, believe me, uncomfortable for the Russians. So we should take this in comfort into consideration if we try to anticipate, you know, the next decade. So, Corey, at the last summit, the Americans showed up with a tough message on 5G, uh, and it hit some shoals. But now we've seen an evolution in this debate in Europe a little bit. How do you see, how should NATO be thinking about, why is NATO talking about China? NATO's talking about China because China's predatory behavior is making many countries in NATO nervous. And I think you see with the progression of the 5G debate in NATO countries, that you're right, Damon, the United States came rolling in and said, anybody who buys a Huawei component is going to be excluded from intelligence sharing. And that, uh, that sent a big signal. It wasn't a particularly graceful way to, um, to talk to your closest friends and closest security partners. But I also think that... Um, you know, the, NATO, the United States is not the only country who's worried about China using technical components, not just for espionage purposes, but for uh, undercutting governance and the rule of law in the societies in which they're operating, as Tomasz just said. And I think the German debate about 5G, where the chancellor started out very strongly supporting China's the free trade argument for China being able to be part of this system, and German, the German intelligence agencies, the German security leadership got increasingly nervous as they got more attentive to the problem. So I think it progresses the way most arguments in NATO progress, which is one or a few countries raise an issue that they're really nervous about, and NATO's the place where we talk about what we're nervous about. And everybody started to, to come to their own conclusions about it. And I do think the American position, as uncharitably as it was, and as undiplomatically as it was rolled out, um, is picking up substantive adherence. And that's a good thing for us all. It's good that we have these arguments. It's how we build a common position. And there's just no substitution for winning the argument. Thanks, Corey. Where are my mic runners? I want to just see mic runners. I want a mic here yes, for our Estonian colleague and a mic here right for our there. Portuguese colleague. And I'm starting with you. I don't see my mic runners. Who are they? Run forward. So please go ahead. You start. Introduce yourself. 
Hi, hello. Okay. Hi, Damon. Uh, Katarzyna Pisarska, I'm the founder and director of uh, program director of the Warsaw Security Forum. Uh, thank you for a fascinating panel, very dynamic, a uh, great job. But I do have uh, two questions. One is to uh, Gulnur. Um, I completely agree with you that allies are becoming, uh, you know, that the biggest challenge for us in NATO is that we have different security uh, challenges and we have different security perspectives. But with all due respect, the fact that President Erdogan uh, threatened to block the plan to defend the Baltic states and Poland is con completely unproductive. I think you have lost a lot of soft power only by that statement. I think it uh, raised a lot of red flags in Central Europe and uh, questioned a lot of uh, Turkey's, Turkey's commitment to our region. So I just wanted to ask you, what did that statement serve for? And uh, do you th think it was the right thing uh, to do? Luna, I'm going to take a couple of questions. So thank you. Our, co our Polish colleagues putting on the table one of the controversies in the run-up to the summit about the defense plan in the east. So Guna, we'll come to you on that, but let me take our Estonian, Estonian colleague and our Portuguese colleague here. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, and thanks for an excellent panel. Uh, Sen Sarko from International Center for Defense and Security in Tallinn. My first question was overtaken. I have exactly the same thing for our uh, <laughs> Turkish friend. Uh, the second one is uh, to you. Uh, Monsieur Gomart, um, kind of explaining President Macron. Um, and the, the question really stems from the fact that he has um, repeatedly said that he, um, that's a, he does not really trust the US anymore and he wants to build a new European security architecture together with Russia. Now, is he aware uh, that this is exactly, precisely what Putin wants? to tear down the existing European security architecture and rebuild a new one where Russia is at the table and the US is not, sure. meaning that Russia would replace US as an outside arbiter of European security. Thank you, Sven. I'm going to discipline our questions to keep them tight, to get as many as possible. Let's turn to you, sir. Thank you, Damon. Um, Ricardo Leite, Member of Parliament from Portugal and uh, President of UNITE, the Global Network of Parliamentarians for Global Health. Um, the issue is around Russia, once again. Uh, the last time I heard the argument on compartmentalizing a relationship with a friend of mine who has a mistress trying to justify how he's going to keep his relationship with his family, well, I'm not sure that's going to work. And within NATO, if we must discuss, and I'd like to hear your opinion, what kind of bilateral and multilateral relationships we can have beyond the family so that the family can continue functional. But I heard everyone, or many of you, mention the, the need to reset the relationship with Russia. My question is, how does Crimea play in that situation? Are we going to give it up altogether? The sanctions clearly are not working. What's the next step? Thank, Thank you. you, Ricardo. And a brief question, Ambassador Poktorova, the final one in this opening, please. Thank you. Thank you, Damon. Um, first of all, congratulations to North Macedonia, coming from a neighbor that have always supported the membership of uh, um, Macedonia in NATO. Uh, you wouldn't be surprised if I bring your attention a little bit farther east from Central Europe, from the Balts. Um, we are discussing Russia and Turkey uh, at great extent. Uh, how would you uh, discuss, how would you comment Russia's uh, uh, influence plus combined with Turkish interests in the Balkans? Would you agree, and I'm trying to be not as provocative as President Macron, but almost, uh, uh, would you agree that the Balkans may turn to be the soft belly of of, uh, of transatlantic security. Terrific. Thank you, Ambassador. Gunnar, why don't you start off with quick responses okay. here and then we'll come I'll down. start off with the issue about this defense plan um, for the Baltics and Poland. Now, this is actually an internal NATO matter. I don't think we should even be talking about this. I think the way it was leaked to the press has also led to a great deal of misunderstandings and it's been pulled into different directions. Uh, Turkey has always been there for the defense of its allies. We've been part of the planning process. We're going to be heading the command of the spearhead force, of the uh, rapid readiness force. Uh, and these are internal NATO matters. Now, regard but now it's out in the press, of course. Uh, these kinds of negotiations do happen within the alliance behind closed doors about certain documents at the approval stage, right? Now, 
the same document of the similar sort uh, for Turkey's security uh, actually framed the YPG as a terrorist organization. Now, some allies, I think actually one particular ally, had an objection to that, and therefore they have blocked Turkey's uh, defense plan. And in turn, at that moment, this other defense plan was about to be approved, and right now Turkey's position is that this cannot be security for some allies, but it has to be security for all allies. What this debate has done, which was unfortunately supposed to be an internal debate, and it's very unfortunate it's, come, it's been leaked out in this way, um, ha, is that it's actually forced us to face the fact that, you know, of course we have different security concerns, like we've talked about China and so forth, medium, long term, but then there are also immediate national security concerns. And there you cannot have a compromise and address the uh, immediate national security concerns of some allies and not address the immediate national concerns of another ally. So at, in terms of national security concerns, we really have to be on the same page. Otherwise, we will not be able to agree on anything else. So That's the time on the clock. I'm gonna, uh, but I want to say a few things on Russia, but maybe let the others pitch in and then come me, back to Russia because I was Bob. asked about that. Okay. Yeah. Let me pick up to Bob yeah. because you had, there was some skepticism about French views. Quick, quick response to the skeptics out there. I, I would respond to your question uh, coming yes. from this gentleman yes. and, and this one. So the question is, is President Macron aware that, you know, a, a discussion directly between Europeans and Russian are the one um, expected by, uh, by Putin? Yes, he is. He's aware. Uh, now, what does it mean? That means also, if you read all the statements, you know that it is always said that we should have a, a dialogue um, franc and direct with Russia, with our allies. And, you know, I have already mentioned the term naivete. There is absolutely no naivete about, you know, the nature of Putin's uh, regime. That leads me to your question. The assessment, the assessment which has been made also by President Macron, it is to take into consideration 2013. And the fact that all weaknesses, all Western weaknesses, give away for Russia, especially in Syria. Where is the coherence, you know, and the consistent approach? Unfortunately for all of us, it is in Russia. If you remind, you know, 2003, there were three countries against, you know, the intervention in Iraq, Russia, Germany, and France. Okay? It was a much more difficult, difficult time than all times, I, I think, you know, for sure. So the problem is, is also to accept that. It's to accept our own failures and the fact that we let, you know, uh, the field to the Russians. No intervention in 2013. Have a look about the consequences, you know, in Syria. So I stop there. So my, I'm going to, just for the sake of the audience, I'm going to uh, jump to the next two questions, this gentleman here and the young woman over there. Please introduce yourself. Quick questions in our last three minutes. Flip it on at the bottom. Justin, yes, you just talk right into it. Yep. Hi there, uh, Justin Bronk from Rusi. I'm an air defense specialist. Uh, my question was to Gulner. Uh, you, you, just, you justified the S-400 purchase, which is one of the key splits within NATO, on the grounds of a key military requirement. How does that sit with the fact that the S-400 system, particularly if not joined up to Turkey's air picture, common air picture, which is NATO standard, so cannot be integrated, A, can't be used against enemy aircraft because you won't see IFF, identification friend or foe, or even air traffic control information, but also the fact that the S-400 system is not actually compatible with defending against the short-range rockets, artillery fire, and mortars from Syrian territory that you're actually concerned about. Thank you, sir. All right, to the young woman over here in 15 seconds, a short question, please. Have confidence, speak right into it. Thank you. Um, would you say that many of the differing opinions within NATO come from um, a different approach to an issue or like a different end goal um, as to what you're trying to achieve? All right, terrific. So to do this wrap up, that's a great question. If you look at these issues in tactical micro, the day to day, my gosh, look, look at all these differences and divisions. Tamar reminded us this ain't new. This is a family. 
This is where family problems get fleshed out. So how significant are these divisions? And if you take perspective on this alliance, Gulner, first answer, Toma, Corey, Tomas. I'll start off with, uh, with Russia, because that was something I was going to say. Now, I mean, having a compartmentalized relationship does not mean a lack of principles. I think that's what you were alluding to. It actually helps in the sense that if uh, you have a geostrategic reality like we do, you know, you just have to look at the map where we are, um, then you have to have these sort of strands of cooperation of, with neighboring states. But the compartmentalized part has allowed us also to be very firm with Russia when it comes to Ukraine. And, you know, we have very good relations with Ukraine. We're actually uh, selling them drones right now. So, you know, we, we've also got a defense agreement with them. And uh, so, and Russia doesn't mind that because we're, you know, doing things in other areas with them. So, but I think overall, we're quite happy to sort of continue like this with our own policy. But because we do value NATO, I think it's, it's important for NATO as you said, a family, to have a wider strategic picture about how we deal with Russia. Thanks. And we totally support that. And as for the S-400, how we're going to use it, in what context, as a standalone system, I can't talk about that. You can appreciate that. Uh, but it will be a standalone system, and all the technical questions are being addressed by the joint U.S.-Turkish uh, committee We've hit the right clock, now. so I'm going to ask my remaining colleagues to give us your headline conclusion, uh, Tomas. Sure. L let me do that really quickly in the light of time and only address the last question. Are there fundamental disagreements among allies or are we looking at tactical differences? My sense, putting on my Central European hat, is that there is no fundamental disagreement between Central European allies and the rest on even the controversial issues, sensitive issues of how do you treat Russia, what exactly is Europe's role in defense. I had a good fortune recently of editing a report for NATO on NATO's next 70 years. The a chapter on deterrence was written by an excellent Polish think tank. The author is here in place. It was very open-minded, very, took a very broad view of deterrence. There is no reflexive insistence on a status quo. What there is, my last 10 seconds, is a concern about the way the conversation was opened. We're open, I think, to exploring whether a better relationship with Russia is available. We understand the need for Europe to stand more on its own feet. It comes not just from President Macron, but also from President Trump. But how you proceed makes an awful lot of difference. We have a security order in Europe that works. It's not perfect. Can it be improved? Absolutely. Is it good that we have almost very little conversation with Russia? No. So we're open to looking at how you fix it. But you don't start out with a presumption, as President Macron seems to have, that the U.S. will inevitably bow out of the European security picture. You don't start out with a presumption that a much better arrangement with Russia can be had, that it's realistic, because evidence suggests uh, otherwise. Thank you. And I'm a son of a doctor, my last sentence. The first rule in medicine is do no harm. And I think that would be a very good way of, of that's a very good philosophy and a mindset uh, to keep in mind as we start thinking about a better security good architecture advice. for good, Europe. Good advice, Toma. Corey. I think we often disagree on the ends because we have more than one end we are trying to attain. We often disagree on the means because there are many different ways to successfully navigate problems. And we often disagree on the language in which we talk about them. But what makes NATO successful and what makes it valuable to all of our countries is the fact that we let ourselves be persuaded by each other and we identify where our interests overlap and where we can find common approaches. And that's why NATO is so successful. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Corey. Final word, Thomas. Yeah, I think that NATO is a family with uh, new members. Welcome to North Macedonia. And in each family, there are turbulent people. So, you know, France is an Atlantic and also a Latin country. And I think that President Macron prepare a very lively dinner for, to, for tomorrow. <laughs> that is right. Our presidents, our prime ministers, the leaders have given us a lively conversation. Please join me in thanking our opening discussants. Could have done a better job. And thank you for being such active participants. The show will continue, please. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, the next session will include remarks in Polish. If you require translation, headsets are available at each seat on the floor. Please tune to Channel One. That's Channel One, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.
To introduce our next speakers, please welcome to the stage Director General of the Royal United Services Institute, Dr. Karen von Hippel. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on defense and deterrence for a new era. I'm Karen von Hippel, the director of one of the crusty think tanks that Shawshank mentioned earlier, but it's really a privilege for all of us to be part of this consortium. And I'd also like to thank all of our partners and all of our incredibly hardworking colleagues who have been putting in a lot of time over the last few weeks. Um, today, it's really a pleasure to welcome two extremely distinguished speakers. Uh, they include His Excellency President Duda of Poland. Most of you know that Poland was the largest country of that early wave of new member states 20 years ago. And today, of course, Poland is really one of the most active members of the alliance. He will be joined by His Excellency Prime Minister Zayev of the Republic of North Macedonia. Uh, as we all know, North Macedonia is about to become the 30th member of NATO, its newest member. Uh, and I, I think it's fair to say that both countries are extremely committed to a strong alliance. They will be, the two speakers will be really discussing how NATO can meet the challenges of this new era of the 21st century. I think given all the uh, issues that were raised already in the morning session, there is a lot for them to talk about. And so uh, we're looking forward to hearing that. Now, I promised, uh, I'm, I'm about to introduce our moderator, Stephen Sacker, who, as all of you know, is the presenter for BBC's Hard Talk. And I really promised him a rousing applause from everyone here. So please join me in welcoming this panel. Thank you. It is a great pleasure to see a packed hall. Uh, it's also my honor and privilege to have two fantastic guest speakers with me today, two leaders who've taken time out from what is, I know, for both of them, a very busy schedule here in London with the NATO summit just ahead. Uh, but they've taken time out to be here to discuss with me some of the very, very important questions facing the NATO Alliance right now. Just by way of introduction, I'm Stephen Sacker. As Karen said, I present the Hard Talk Show on BBC News. Uh, my day job is grilling and challenging people in power, holding them to account, and I'll be doing a little bit of that today. Uh, but both of my guests, I think it is fair to say, are viewing this NATO summit as something of very great significance. President Duda of course, representing uh, Poland, one of the states which I would say right now is at the forefront of discussions of NATO's future. Poland very proud to meet the 2% of GDP spending commitment on defense. Uh, and we have uh, Prime Minister Zayev of North Macedonia, who of course is on the very cusp of joining the NATO alliance. It, I was just talking to the Prime Minister. He believes that the final phase of ratification will be done early in the new year, and then North Macedonia will be the 30th member of NATO. So, two wonderful guests to have with us. Uh, we have built this uh, as part of the NATO engages uh, event here. We build this as a discussion of defense and deterrence in a new era, and I think it is fair to say that NATO right now faces hugely important existential questions. So I'm going to ask both of you to open up with a, just some short opening remarks addressing the challenges that NATO faces today. I think challenges which get down to what is NATO for in this new era. So with that in mind, President Duda, would you kick us off? Uh, good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, 
He told me that uh, I have two minutes to, to open this discussion, but this is very, very, very difficult to, to answer this question, a very complicated question in two minutes, because you have to look at the history of my country. This, the truth is we, we've been for more than 40 years behind the Iron Curtain. Yes, we, no, Poland was not was not fully independent, was, was not, was not uh, fully free country. And in 1989, we broke down the Iron Curtain. We, we won this very important battle and, and we, we, we became a member of, the, of a really free world, democratic Europe. And that was, I can say, our dream to join NATO, the strongest military, but defense alliance in the world we 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 dreamed about it to, 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 we we dream about uh, joining the european union and 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 and, and we did it uh, first nato in 1999 yes and 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 after 5 years in 24 uh, we joined european union and 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 if you ask me about nato about our membership in, in nato about my my my, my vision of NATO, I, I, what, what I can say. First, we are very proud to be in NATO, yes, because, uh, as I said, NATO is the, is the strongest military alliance in the world, and um, we can say that Europe, but especially this Euro-Atlantic area, is one of the most peaceful and, and, and most, uh, and most uh, safe uh, areas in the world now because of, because of NATO ex uh, existation. And, 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 what can, and what can I say more? What is our goal looking at, at NATO? Yes, We would like to have NATO strong. We would like to have NATO uh, united. We, we would like to, 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 to preserve this cohesion of NATO and 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 uh, what was our uh, NATO's best achievement during the last few years? I can say that was um, uh, the um, establishing of, of NATO presence on the, on the in the eastern flank. Yes, that was very important for our country. That was very important for Baltic states after the Russian invasion uh, first in Georgia, 2008, and and then uh, in. in in, in Ukraine in, in 2014, uh, this, um, this uh, enhanced forward presence in, in, the, in the eastern flank is one of, the, one, of the, one of the greatest achievements of NATO now. Great. Well, I, if I may then, I'm going to stop you there, President Duda, because what you've laid out there is uh, a vision based, as you put it, your words, on cohesion, on unity, and a real focus right now on NATO's eastern flank. So those are all key points that I want to keep in my head and we will come back to in the discussion. Now, Prime Minister Zayev, I want you, again, briefly if you can, just as we approach this NATO summit, to lay out for me as an incoming member what you see as the purpose of NATO right now, and particularly bearing in mind your own interests in the Balkans. So thank you very much. Thank you for inviting us. It's, uh, for us, it's a specific pleasure because we are the next member country of NATO, 30th member country of NATO. It's good for NATO because 30th is better than 29. <laughs> but uh, of course, for the region, for the Western Balkans, Southeastern Europe, it's a precious one uh, achievement because mean more stability, security, safety, and immediately mean investment foreign and direct investment. Uh, everybody who is here must remember them that Balkan in the past was full of conflicts, wars, ethnical wars, a lot of damage, uh, damage for the region but for the whole European continent. Now NATO membership uh, after Montenegro, uh, we are next member of NATO, that means really a lot of stability and security. Our citizens for this region, I can talk from the citizens from Republic of North Macedonia, so much belief in NATO, in unity, in stability, so we even changed our constitutional name. We became Republic of North Macedonia, of course, because of building good relations with our neighbors. We are a country without open bilateral 
issues with any countries in the neighborhood, but of course that opened the doors for our strategic goal. We fulfill our dream now, like Poland fulfilled 1999, uh, because uh, strategic goal for us means security, stability, no anymore uh, young people to be part of conflicts, to die, etc., but also to participate, to keep peace all around the world and share peace uh, all around the world. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, it, that bring a lot of economic aspects because also that strength ruling of law, democracy values, uh, freedoms, etc., etc. Excellent. Well, Prime Minister, thank you very much. Thank you both. So you both, as I frankly expected, are leaders who come to NATO using the rhetoric of unity, of cohesion, of stability within the NATO alliance. But now that we get to the q and I'm going to introduce perhaps a, a little bit of sort of scepticism into the conversation. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I should say I'm going to sort of uh, quiz the two of them for 10 minutes or so. And then before we end the session, I absolutely want to see hands in the air and I want to get you guys involved as well. This is going to be question and answer. It's going to be uh, proactive uh, and interactive. So do frame your own questions as well. But let me start, President Duda, by suggesting to you that everything we've seen, whether it be from President Donald Trump and his deep skepticism about the pre preparedness of Europe to burden share in a realistic way, or whether it be from President Macron, who, as we know, in recent days has expressed his fear that, that NATO is brain dead in terms of having a meaningful conversation about its future strategy, there are deep divisions and disagreements within the NATO alliance. Would you accept that? You are talking about, about uh, the political discussions, yes, but uh, I also look at the, mm, at the results, yes. What is the result? The result is, is, is NATO presence on the Eastern Front. This is the result for me, yes. This is what I, what I expected. This is what, what we have. Now in Poland. But, but with respect, even in that, Mr. President, you have big problems. The Turkish government is now saying that it will block some of the new arrangements on the eastern flank, the defense of the Baltics, and I guess Poland as well, unless you all, as a united alliance, sign on to the notion that the, the Kurdish groups in northern Syria are terrorists and formally acknowledge. That yes, but NATO is an alliance of almost 30 uh, states, yes, 30 countries, and there are many interests, yes, and 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 of course this is the huge field of the discussion of the of the negotiation. I talked yesterday with uh, Mr. President Erdogan, and I hope that we will find a good solution. <laughs> but but the, the point is, the outside world looking at NATO today. Here's your language about <coughs> unity and cohesion, but sees a reality, you call it politics, but sees a reality where increasingly the alliance isn't functioning as it should because of these internal divisions. In general, I don't agree. Because uh, look, at the, look at the perspective of last uh, 30 years, yes? In the 90s, we can say that NATO didn't exist. What, do you remember something about NATO in the 90s? Well, it was a different era in the 90s. Of yes. course, NATO was and still and heavily yes, and in time, defending Europe's borders. Time but, changed, but yes. We, yes, but we had, we, had, we had new events, yes. We had, as I said before, uh, we had uh, we had uh, Russian aggression uh, on, on on Georgia in Georgia yes in in 2008 we had we we have now Russian occupation of Crimea and part of of, of, of Ukraine and it started uh, in uh, in uh, 2014 so five years ago and 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 we still have a threat of the next invasion and what about NATO and NATO in my opinion NATO has shown that uh, that is is alive because that there was there was a, a, there was a, a, a very a very fast reaction of NATO for all this uh, for all, all this um, uh, changing of uh, of the situation 
just one more point, then I want to get Prime Minister say it, but President Macron, and I'm sure you read his economist interview just as I did, he, he is suggesting now that NATO has to move beyond regarding Russia as the prime threat, and your focus is on the eastern flank, but he's saying it's time for NATO to actually move beyond the eastern flank question and look at what is happening in the Sahel, for example. Look what's happening in terms of the global terror threat, in terms of cyber security, in terms of artificial intelligence. He actually wants a fundamental reset of the NATO strategic mind. You're suggesting NATO's strategic mind is, is stuck on Russia. Yes, but I don't, but, but I still don't see a problem. We can discuss about this. Because, you know, I, I, I believe in uh, 300, uh, 360 degree policy, yes? And, and, and for me, it's, it's crucial that we have to look around. This is not the only problem of the eastern flank. We are a member of NATO, but we, don't, we understand what it means that we are a member of NATO. This is not the, the pro, only the problem of our security, of, 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 of the defense of Polish and or, or Baltic states' borders, yes? This is also the problem of, of, the, of the southern Europe, yes? This is the, also the, the problem of, the, um, of, the, of, of, um, of, of a terrorist uh, threat and, and other. So, so I understand it very well, and I'm ready to discuss about it. So that's why we spent more than 2% of our GDP for def on, on defense because we are ready to fulfill um, or our duties uh, or our responsibilities as a NATO uh, member. Fascinating stuff. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Zayev, I want to come to you. Just some quick fire questions. Number one, we've just been talking about Poland's uh, uh, commitment to beating that 2% of GDP threshold on defense spending. You're the new member coming in in the new year. Can you guarantee to us all that you will be spending more than 2% of GDP on defense? I think that uh, in the last two and a half years, we have achievement what is very rare in the European continent. We even doubled our expenditures for, for defense. We was 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Now we are more than 1.4% of our GDP. Right, so and of course, far short of what the Americans have demanded for a long time. Yes, but the goal is not later than 2024 to achieve 2%. I think that we will get it that earlier. And also we spend it more than 20%, in the moment 24% for modernization of our army, what is also one of the very important, very important thing. What is, as I mentioned, it very rare in the other member countries in European Union, Poland is a good example, but also we are the next member country and we started two and a half years and we do it 0.2% every year more. Uh I wouldn't say patience is Donald Trump's greatest virtue. And when he hears you saying, well, we'll get to 1.4% and then hopefully we'll move to 2% over a period of time, he may not regard that as hugely impressive. And when I, you said to me, you know, we've dreamed in Macedonia for a long time, North Macedonia, we've dreamed for a long time about joining NATO. I just wonder whether you worry that at the time you are now joining the alliance, the Americans are clearly having a conversation back home about whether they have a future in this alliance. You probably saw John Bolton, the former national security advisor to Donald Trump, said that he believed if Donald Trump wins a second term, the United States may go into full isolationist mode. Are you worried about the viability of the alliance, in particular America's role in the alliance? Uh, I, the president uh, uh, mentioned it. It's a political debate, really. I think that every member country will never forget the reasons of preparing uh, NATO, like uh, biggest, uh, biggest uh, alliance in the world, uh, keeping, uh, fighting for keeping peace and stability and security. And in that mind, of course, there will be inside debate, of course, in the future. Uh, can be happen a lot of reforms uh, in NATO in alliance. We must be more prepared for defense and deterring. Of course, it's a third decade for 21st century will start next year, and the NATO must be prepared for the new challenges. But I don't believe that something uh, uh, big will happen with somebody who will go out from NATO. So the the power of attraction of NATO it's uh, really big. 
and I think that we'll continue in this direction, but of course there must be inside debate for final decisions having of, of that, uh, that matter. You know how you mentioned it, hard talks can be easiest one if we have really clear vision for our future, also in NATO, because we believe that we will be very soon full members of, of NATO. Well, I'm, I'm all for a bit of hard talk, that's for <laughs> sure. So, but I suspect some in our audience may be for a bit of hard talk too. So let me just quickly scan the room now, see if there are any hands going up who want to join the conversation at this moment. I've got lots more questions, but I do want to make this as interactive as possible. So if anybody at this point would like to ask a question of President Duda or Prime Minister Zayev, uh, you, sir, have a hand up, so we'll get to you. There's a microphone there. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Philip Darabenda. I'm a student from the University of Kent. Uh, this is a question to North Macedonia. Do you believe that Poland has become a global, I mean, a regional superpower with the Free Seas Initiative and its close link with the United States? Do you see working closer with Poland and its initiatives? I mean, as you, as you spoke about um, Donald Trump cutting his kind of uh, you know, ties with Europe, uh, do you believe that Poland could be a bridge between the US and Europe in that sense? Okay. Yes, of course. Well, you're the, sitting here, so I didn't think you were going no, to no, no, no. Oh. <laughs> so Poland, Poland is one of the countries who was in the in the in the in the past one of the biggest supporter for our country to achieve not only solutions of all these bilateral issues, but standards. What is needed to fulfil to be full members of NATO and also a member of European Union. Uh, of course, that kind of politics from all Visegrad group before and especially Poland was a good example for us. How they manage with the situation, how to help each other. So they share the whole experience with us in six Western Balkan countries to achieve as soon as possible all needed criteria. So we fulfill all criteria, uh, having in mind that we are a democratic country, that ruling of law is very important, like uh, the criteria in NATO, uh, complete freedoms, of course, and uh, that, is, that is very helpful if for I us. May, Prime Minister, and I want the President's view on this, well, I want to pick up on that question by just reflecting again on politics. Now, you two say, ah, oh, Stephen, you know, politics is politics, but the alliance goes on. But the fact is, just last month, you received a major kick in the teeth from France <laughs> because <laughs> President Macron basically blocked your accession talks going ahead for North Macedonia and for Albania, and he said, you know what, I'm not happy anymore with the entire accession process. We've got to restructure it, reframe it, and we're going to call a halt to further accessions. It seems to me that creates another big political tension inside NATO, because here's Macron saying, I want more focus on the EU as a strategic defense alliance platform, and at the same time, he's blocking you from EU membership, which creates tensions inside NATO. How worried are you about these new tensions within Europe? What's really unfair for us, like candidate countries, we are candidate country 15 years, and we have 10 positive recommendations, and now they confirm all 28 uh, countries there, uh, in the European Union Council, they confirm that we fulfill 100% of the reforms. Upon that, we find solution with Bulgaria. Upon that, we find solution with this, through hi this historical agreement with Greece. Through this agreement, we even change our constitutional name normally. And he decide, also he mentioned it, that now Europe needs more time because of future reforms. Of course, uh, was very disturbing for us and uh, we was very much dis disappointed, but we're continuing with these reforms, what we do, do, and we hope that this mistake, because was mistake for Europe, not only for us, uh, will be uh, changed very soon. All countries, only France, was the, the only one who expect uh, the debate for the new methodology for enlargement of European Union, and we uh, hope that we will continue very soon our path to full membership of European Union. To, to be blunt about it, President Duda, do you see the things that President Macron is doing right now in a European context and in a NATO context as being deeply problematic? Would you use the same language of mistakes being made? I'm sure that uh, Euro-Atlantic Alliance is one of the crucial elements of our stability. Uh, I'm talking about Europe, not only about Poland, about our, our stability and, 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 uh, and, uh, and our security, yes. 
And uh, the question is, what, what shall we do to, to preserve and to, to, to protect um, all, um, all this achievement we have now? Because I can say that, look at the European Union and look at the NATO. Of course, we know there are many problems in both alliances. Yes, there is. There are tensions, and we have Brexit uh, in European Union. Okay, I know. But do we, can you? But 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 can you can you show me the the the, 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 the greatest successes in in uh, in the entire world than those two? Unions, yes, two alliances, NATO alliance and European Union alliance. No, this is this is uh, two best um, institutions created in the world during the last 100 years. Yes, and of course we have tensions because we have many countries. As I said, many countries with uh, their own interests. Yes, and and uh, and we have to discuss how to improve. Uh, uh, the problems, how to improve mechanisms, and uh, if you if you hear the voice of Mr. President Macron, yes, um, I would like to ask him, Mr. President, don't talk about the brain of the of the NATO and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's please propose us what can we do to um, to to improve um, our cooperation in NATO, in your opinion? Okay. Yes. Yes. But concrete, please, please give us concrete proposition. Yes. What What shall we do? Okay. This is the This is the first I, I, element. But the Mr. President, <laughs> we're running short of time, and I want to ask some very quick five questions. But I also want to get at least one more audience question in, and we're short of time. Sorry, Mr. President, but uh, we'll come back to, to you. I promise you. Hello. Yes, um, sir. Paul Taylor from Friends of Europe. Uh, to both presidents, y you've talked really only about the Eastern Front and the Balkans. Um, but many people inside NATO also see security challenges in the South. Uh, and really, there's been no thought, apparently, given at all to that at the moment. So what, do you, what more do you think NATO should be doing in the South? Who should be taking care of security in the Sahel, uh, stabilizing Libya, uh, uh, um, looking at uh, possibly uh, peacekeeping in the, uh, in the Near East and so on? Are those roles for NATO, or if not, for whom? Okay, Thank you. Good, good question. But I both of you, can I ask now for really brief answers to the point, because we want to squeeze in as much as possible. So, President Duda first on that one. I have no doubts that we have to look at the NATO as the alliance of all uh, member, member states, yes? So this uh, approach, NATO uh, 360 degrees, is, is the crucial idea uh, in NATO. And, and, and we should look at the eastern flank of NATO, and we also should look at the, at the southern flank of the, of the NATO, and, and we have to achieve all, all, um, all uh, and we have to, 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 to to try to answer for all uh, the challenges we have there. So this is, I, I have no doubts. All right, and Prime Minister Zayed. I think uh, if we mention it, that, is, that, that NATO is the biggest alliance in the world and the more important war and peace uh, factor in the world, also have responsibility to keep peace all around the world. And of course, some uh, aspects of more focus in the, in the South because there is really need as soon as possible peace. Everybody who can help can address there and to be more focused. Also, NATO have bigger responsibility right, for that. Right, so you're both talking about you know, the 360-degree approach, but let me ask you a very simple question. You can almost answer it yes or no. Is Vladimir Putin's Russia still the number one threat to NATO? I think the, the, the NATO have the threats in front of, 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 of alliance uh, connected with the modern world, with 21st century. Uh, cyber threats, uh, security threats, uh, that, that kind of hybrid threats, what has happened very much. And we must be very much focused all together to share experience, yeah. how to find all that, to, to deter that, and of course uh, to defend from that. That is the, the modern threats. Sometimes can, can happen also from inside of NATO countries. It depends on what kind of radical structures are playing or not. Russia still the number one threat? 
I don't want to assess which threat is, 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 is higher, which threat is more dangerous. Yes, we have terrorist threat now, we have um, uh, threat of uh, Russian imperialism, uh, we have uh, threats on, on the uh, uh, Middle East, yes, we have many threats around and we have answered. Uh, I sadly have a threat of my own to deal with now because I've got a red badge up there saying time's up, which is most unfortunate because I know there are lots more questions uh, in the hall and I know hands are still going up, but I have been told on the strict pain of punishment that if I overrun too much, I'll, I'll, I'll be carted off and sent to the Tower of London or something. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm sorry that I haven't managed to squeeze more questions in. I think you'll all agree that the input from both of our leaders here has been fascinating fascinating, nuanced but fascinating. So I thank you, President Duda and Prime Minister Zayef very much indeed, and I thank you all for listening so patiently. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief International Correspondent at the BBC, Ms. Lise Doucette. Good afternoon, ladies. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. And happy birthday. I have to say that I have never been to such a big birthday party in my life. And on top of it, a 70th birthday party for NATO. What a great privilege for all of us to be here. The NATO Secretary General describes this 70-year-old as active, agile, adapting to the future. Wow, not bad for a 70-year-old. You know, they say 70 is the new 40. <laughs> Hashtag sure. Now, I'm told about half of this audience is actually under the age of 40. Where are you? All the under 40s. Oh, la, la. 70 is the new 40? You'll find out. But, do you know, others are making other comments commenting on the mental health of this 70-year-old, saying the 70-year-old is brain dead. And also, others make ageist comments, saying the 70-year-old is obsolete. So what kind of a birthday party will this be? Ladies and gentlemen, jo please join me in welcoming the man who will set the table for the birthday party, Jens Stoltenberg. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Happy birthday. Thank you so much and happy birthday to all of you. Yes. <laughs> and I must, I must begin with the question I think that is on everybody's mind. And that How is? was your breakfast with President Trump? <laughs> <laughs> it was, as always, a great breakfast. And, uh, and uh, we had uh, omelette and uh, <laughs> some uh, sausages and uh, uh, brown toast and uh, oranges. So that was a great breakfast. Um, uh, and uh, as always, paid by the United States. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so we have fair oh. burden sharing. Oh dear, yeah. be careful. Yeah. <laughs> I hope there was a bit of burden sharing yeah. there, and the Norwegians perhaps provided some sausages. <laughs> or, but a lot of words must have gone back and forth across that table. Let's just randomly pick three. Very, very nasty. That's what how President Trump has described President Macron's comment about the NATO alliance, declaring it strategically brain dead. Now I know Norwegians and NATO Secretary Generals don't use words like nasty, but at the very least, the comments by President Macron weren't nice. 
I have a comment uh, what he has said, and, uh, and I don't agree. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, more important than, uh, that I uh, don't agree is the fact that when you look at NATO, uh, you see that we are actually delivering. We are doing more. We are acting together. We are, we are proving every day that this alliance is, uh, is, uh, is agile, is active, and it's delivering. Uh, uh, I have, uh, for instance, so we have just implemented the biggest reinforcements of our collective defense uh, in a generation since the end of the Cold War. For the first time in our history, we have combat ready troops in the eastern part of the alliance. Uh, we have tripled the size of the NATO response force. We're able to reinforce if needed. Uh, we invest in high-end capabilities. We step up in the fight against terrorism in the new training mission in Iraq. And European allies are investing more in uh, defense. So if but you just looked at, look at the substance, we, you, you can see that this alliance is delivering. Well, some say it's the most successful alliance in history, but there now seems to be some fundamental disagreements about this alliance's future, <coughs> its mission. And at the very least, for, to be the NATO Secretary General at this time, the fact that big people are raising big questions in public must be a matter of concern. So yes and no, because... Let's uh, deal with the yes first. Yeah, because the yes, of course, we should never uh, question the unity and the, uh, the willingness, the political willingness to stand and uh, together and to defend each other, because the whole purpose of NATO is to preserve peace, is to prevent conflict by sending a clear message to any potential adversary that if one ally is attacked, it will trigger the response from the whole alliance, and by doing that, we preserve the peace, we prevent any uh, conflict. So let's, let's be clear on this, because as you know, deterrence is not just a question of military hardware. You're, no, you're doing well on that front. Uh -huh. It's also a question of perception and yes. political credibility. Yes. And therefore, NATO's credibility has been dented by these very public rows about even your founding principle. One for one and one for all for one and one for all. Collective security. Yes, but then but I think, but, 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 but I also strongly believe that the best way of expressing this well is actually through what we do. Uh, action speaks louder than words. And the fact that we have these troops in the eastern part of the lines, for the first time combat ready troops, uh, which are multilateral, uh, multinational troops, uh, headed by or led by uh, the US, Canada, United Kingdom, Germany, uh, that sends a very clear message that uh, if any of these countries are attacked, uh, NATO is all, uh, already there. It will trigger the, a response from the whole alliance. The Baltic expansion was a huge achievement, but you have President Erdogan coming telling you that if you don't recognize his, the, his Kurdish enemies, the Kurds in Syria, as terrorists, he's not going to, he's going to block the Baltic expansion. Can you find a form of words to come out of this summit with healing that rift and well, keeping the Baltic well, it, expansion? It, it's well known that we have some issues related to how to designate the YPG, PYG, uh, uh, the, the organization in, in, in Syria. There are different views among NATO allies. But we have plans in place uh, to protect all the Baltic countries and Poland and all other allies. Uh, and, and more than plans, we have forces. Uh, the fact that we have forces there uh, sends a very clear message about our readiness to protect and defend all allies. And sometimes you also hear that the U.S. is leaving Europe. That's not correct. The U.S. is actually increasing their presence in Europe. It's correct that after the end of the Cold War, the uh, U.S. gradually reduced its military presence. The last U.S. battle tank left Bremerhaven in December 2013, but now the U.S. is back with a full armor brigade and pre-positioned equipment for yet another brigade and even more. So, so there's more U.S. presence in Europe, more U.S. troops in Europe. I, I can't think about any stronger way to demonstrate U.S. commitment to Europe than that. Okay, but let's, let's, let's deal with it just one issue by issue. So, do you think by tomorrow, when the declaration of some kind is made, you will have found a form of words to resolve this growing rift with Turkey? I will not promise that, but uh, what I can say is that we are working on that and that uh, we already have plans in place. So what we are discussing is the revision of plans. We are constantly updating and revising plans, but it's not like NATO doesn't have a plan to defend the Baltic countries. We have a plan, and as I said, we have the forces, so, and we have the presence. Uh, so I think that's the strongest expression of our uh, collective defense, our commitment to NATO's collective defense clause. President Macron has defended his comments, and he actually says it's been a wake-up call for NATO. So it's been helpful. Others in the alliance look at it differently. They're saying, actually, his comments backfired. 
because some big NATO partners like Germany doubled down on their commitment to NATO. How would you describe his intervention? We'll, we'll take, I know you can't criticize, let's just take the personality out of it. Mm. That intervention. Well, Helpful, a wake up call or backfired? Uh, no, I will, I will not go into that. What I will say is that I, I don't agree. Uh, but uh, if, and, and then the most important thing is uh, for me actually what NATO does. I expect. But NATO did it did it force you? To, for example, I understand there is going to be at this at this meeting. It's not a summit. Um, there's going to be an agreement on a wise persons group to look at NATO's future strategy. What I expect the leaders to agree is that we will conduct a process, uh, a reflection uh, on how to further strengthen the political dimension of NATO. Exactly how we organize that, uh, I expect the allies to ask me to put forward proposals. But, but the important thing is not exactly how we organize such a reflection. The important thing is that we reflect on uh, not whether we need NATO, not the question of fundamentals of NATO, but that we reflect on how can we further strengthen NATO, especially the political dimension of NATO. And I, and I think that's a good thing because we are 29 allies from both sides of the Atlantic. Of course, there are differences. It would be strange if 29 allies uh, with different different political parties, different history, different geography, always agreed on everything. But the, the, the lesson we have learned from history is that despite these differences, we have always been able to unite around our core task to protect and defend each other because it's in our, international, uh, our national security interest to do so. And we have to sometimes remember that it's not the first time there are differences between NATO allies. Going back to the Suez crisis in 56, or when France decided to leave the military cooperation in 66, uh, or, or, or the Iraq war in 2003, and many other examples, there have been differences. But this alliance has shown an incredible strength, a resilience, and ability to deal with these differences without weakening the core task of this alliance. But, st but still, you're absolutely right that, that NATO has had to deal with these challenges consistently throughout, its, throughout the decades. But there wasn't Twitter in 1956 no, or in true. 1966. There wasn't the kind of social media, which means our perceptions are forged by the fact that there's this instantaneous information. And this is something that every morning you wake up, you must wonder what's going to be on Twitter today. Yes, but I think you just have to realize that that's a different world, that's true. But if you look at, for instance, the opinion polls, especially in the United States, it's record high support for, uh, for, for, for NATO. Uh, and not only uh, in the public opinion in the United States, but also in the Congress. They have stated again and again the strong support for NATO. So there is this big paradox that while people are questioning uh, the, the strength of the transatlantic bond on both sides of the Atlantic, actually there is stronger public popular support for NATO than it has been for many, many, many years in most of the NATO allied countries, especially in the United States. Second, we are doing more together in North America and Europe than we have done for decades. Uh, with more U.S. presence and European uh, allies uh, stepping up. You know, I'm a politician and I'm used to be criticized for having good rhetoric, uh, rhetorics but bad substance. In NATO, it's the opposite. We have bad rhetorics but ext extremely good substance. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's a good thing. Let's, let's take some questions from the audience. This, the lady in red and the man in blue. I'm Patricia Sasnal from the Polish Institute of International Affairs, and I want to ask you about the substance, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, it seems to me that there is one country behind the controversies uh, in the political lack of cohesion within NATO, both when it comes to President Trump's uh, criticism of NATO and President Macron's uh, ideas for NATO in the future, and that's China. So my simple question to you is what, NATO, what is NATO's idea for China? And it's on the agenda the first, for the first time in a NATO, a NATO yeah. meeting. Yeah. China. So I, I think the answer is that it is a very important thing that we have agreed in NATO that we need to address the rise of China together. Because until now, China was not on, on our agenda in a way. We, 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 we left that to, the, to different allies, especially the United States and some other allies which are present in the Pacific, but China was not a NATO issue. But we have now, of course, recognized that the rise of China has security implications for all allies. Uh, there are some opportunities, but also some obvious challenges. China has the second largest defense budget in the world. They recently displayed a lot of new modern capabilities, including long-range missiles able to reach all of Europe and uh, uh, the United States. 
hypersonic missiles, gliders, uh, um, uh, and, and we also see that uh, this is not about moving NATO into the South China Sea, but it's about taking into account that China is coming closer to us in the Arctic, in Africa, investing heavily in our infrastructure in uh, Europe, in cyberspace. So, so we just have to uh, understand that this has implications for NATO. And it is, a, uh, uh, as a, for the first time, uh, we have then decided that we need to address this together and we have work going on in NATO to to then uh, develop a common uh, approach to China. Not to create a new adversary, but just to analyze, understand, and then respond in a balanced way to the challenges uh, China poses. And there was a question here. No, question went away. Then to this gentleman. Solomon Passi, the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria. One question and one invitation, Secretary General. The question is to follow up on the question on China. Isn't it time not to make an, uh, a new, uh, new adversary from China, but to make uh, a new uh, sort of a dialogue establishing NATO-China Council in the way in which we have NATO-Russia Council? It may work better than the, the, the previous one. This was a suggestion which the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria made uh, some 10 years ago, but today I would upgrade it with uh, one idea more. Uh, in order to understand the Chinese, we need sort of a, a technological bridge with Taiwan, which may help us a lot. And the invitation uh, follows. Uh, since, uh, uh, since Lord Carrington, uh, your predecessor, you are the first Secretary General of NATO who hasn't had the chance to address the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria. Okay. Uh, I was not okay. persuasive <laughs> enough, so I make okay. use of this occasion to invite you to address the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria like uh, okay, your good. first All predecessor, <laughs> Donor, did. Uh, All 500 of us will be there, don't worry. Uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, but I recently visited Bulgaria, mm -hmm. so, uh, so I have to come back, I understand. Okay. Uh, let's, yeah. let's just take a, just take a, just get a sprinkling to see what the mood is in the audience. Can we get a microphone, the gentleman with the, with the, yeah, with the, people think it's an auction here with their papers in the... Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. Secretary General, thank you for your comments. Uh, as you know, NATO spends about 15 times more on defense than Russia does. Only four NATO states physically border on Russia, six if you count the uh, Kaliningrad. So I'm wondering, why is spending more money going to make NATO more secure? And spending more money really doesn't address what I think is a primary Russian threat, namely active measures. Could you comment on both those, please? I didn't get the, the name. Active measures. Active measures. Oh. Why spend more? So let's take first the issue of a NATO-China Council. We don't have any plans to establish a NATO-China Council, but we uh, believe in also, of course, also have political contacts uh, with, uh, with uh, China. Uh, we have some military lines of communications. Uh, uh, the, the, the Deputy Secretary General, the former Deputy Secretary General, visited uh, China, uh, 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 I think, a year ago or something. Uh, and, and, of course, we are not going to establish a new adversary, but we just have to take into account that the rise of China has implications for our security, and we are now analyzing uh, and addressing that uh, uh, together. Uh, uh, on, on defense spending, you know, I'm always a bit careful about these figures, uh, partly because, you know, when you compare NATO defense spending with Russia defense spending, you use market prices for currency, uh, and you don't take into account the huge cost differences. So, of course, the cost for, you know, for, for a soldier, an officer in Russia is totally different than the cost uh, in, uh, in a NATO allied country, or in Norway, or in the United States, or, or, or Britain. So if you try to introduce some kind of uh, purchasing power comparisons, then those figures are totally different. Uh, so I'm not saying, as I'm only saying that to find uh, precise and, uh, and accurate ways to measure is not so easy when you uh, compare so different economies with so totally different cost levels. Second, uh, NATO's increased defense spending is not only about Russia. It, it's correct that it was triggered by the fact that Russia I used military force against neighbors in Ukraine, in, the, in Georgia, uh, uh, but also by the fact that we had to step up in the fight against terrorism. It's not, it's, it, it was a big uh, military undertaking to liberate all the territory that ISIS controlled in Iraq and uh, Syria. Um, uh, and we need to respond also to new threats, including in cyber. We need high readiness of forces and all that. So, we all reduced defense spending after the end of the Cold War to record low, uh, low uh, numbers, 
But then uh, when we do that, when tensions are going down, we have to be able also to increase defense spending when tensions are going up. And 2% is historically not that high. During the Cold War, it's more like 3 and 4%. So uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's the right thing to do. And, and I welcome the fact that actually allies now are increasing. Uh, when we made the pledge, uh, three allies met the 2% guideline. Now nine allies meet uh, the 2% the, uh, guideline. All allies have stopped the cuts. All allies are increasing. And the majority of allies have plans in place to meet 2% by, uh, by 2024. So this is a huge difference. Uh, and uh, and uh, that shows that NATO is delivering. We are agile and active. You've often said, Secretary General, that there's a two-track approach to Russia, dialogue and deterrence. Yeah. Some NATO members are saying there should be more dialogue. Do you, do you think the balance is right now, or is this something you think should be discussed here in London or outside London? So first of all, I strongly believe in this dual-track approach, uh, because I think there is no contradiction between deterrence, defense, and dialogue. Actually, I believe as long as we are strong, as long as we are firm, we can also engage in a dialogue with Russia. And, and I, I say that also because that's my Norwegian experience. Uh, even during the coldest period of the Cold War, uh, we were able to work with Russia on issues like uh, the delimitation line in the Barents Sea, fishery, energy, environment, many other things. So it's possible to, to make deals with Russia. Uh, and I strongly believe that NATO and NATO allies can, uh, can do the same. Uh, I agree, also we need to deliver on the terms and defense, and we are delivering on that. But at the same time, uh, I think that we could do more and should do more on dialogue. Uh, this is partly to try to strive for a better relationship with Russia, but even if we don't believe that we're able to improve the relationship with Russia, at least in the near future, we need to manage a difficult relationship. Uh, uh, avoid incidents, accidents with more military presence, with, uh, with high tensions, we have to make sure that we have as much transparency and predictability as possible to avoid uh, dangerous situations from occurring. The last thing I would say about um, dialogue with Russia is arms control. We need to find new ways of addressing arms control. The demise of the INF Treaty is really a serious setback. Uh, uh, we need to find, uh, and that was one of the issues we will uh, discuss at the leaders' meeting tomorrow, how to reinvigorate, how to uh, find ways uh, to uh, conduct credible uh, real arms control, especially in the nuclear domain. Okay. I wonder if there's more under 35 who want to ask a question. There is, there is a woman there was, over there. And oh, she, there, okay. We're not able to see her because she, she's... Uh, and then there's, we'll take, okay, there's two women here. And oh, there's the men here. Thank you, I'm 32. <laughs> Um, Dr. Catherine Wright, lecturer in international politics at Newcastle University. Um, so NATO reaffirmed its commitment to UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda last year in the revised NATO EPAC policy. Um, I wondered if you could tell us, Secretary General, what is the value of Women, Peace and Security to NATO? Thank you. Okay, do you want to just hold that? So there's, there's, there's two, there's three. Okay, you, oh, the man took the microphone. Okay. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Alessandro Marrone from International Affairs Institute Rome. Uh, as NATO is a political military alliance, not just a military one, uh, how do you see uh, possible developments in terms of partnership with uh, countries uh, in North Africa and Middle East uh, and effort to stabilize uh, the southern flank of NATO? Thank you. Okay. 1325, Women, Peace and Security. The Women, Peace and Security is extremely important for uh, NATO. And actually, when I was Prime Minister in Norway, and, uh, Norway actually was the first country to finance a special post, a special representative on Women, Peace and Security. And now this is a permanent uh, position in uh, uh, NATO. Because uh, we realize that uh, gender equality is not only the right thing to do, but also the smart thing to do. This is part about mobilizing uh, uh, women uh, uh, as part of the, also the, the armed forces in our member states, um, uh, but also, of course, uh, when we do missions and operations to make sure that we do everything we can uh, to uh, prevent uh, sexual uh, uh, abuse uh, uh, and other ways of, uh, of misconduct, uh, uh, partly by our own forces, so they are all trained and, uh, and, and, and in a way um, also learned how to behave, but, but um, not least by reporting when we uh, see examples of uh, misconduct or sexual abuse or, or, or bad behavior against women uh, and uh, children. Uh, and also when we train, as we train the Afghan forces, we train uh, forces elsewhere in the world, uh, Iraqi forces, then um, uh, uh, women, peace and security is part of uh, that. Okay. And in terms of counterterrorism and 
cooperation to the south? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, no, uh, sorry. Uh, no, we, that's of course important. We, I strongly believe that NATO has to be able to deploy a large number of troops in big combat operations uh, to fight terrorism as we have done or, 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 or to address crisis as we have done in the Balkans and uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, we have to be able to do, uh, do that again. But in the long run, it's better to train local forces. Prevention is better than intervention. So I strongly believe in working with partners and enabling them to stabilize their own country. And therefore, we work also with partners in North Africa, uh, especially Tunisia, but also other uh, partners in North Africa, helping them to develop their defense and security institutions, intelligence, special operation forces. Because if we are able to do that, then they will uh, 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 more, uh, it's more, more likely they will succeed in, uh, in stabilizing their own countries. And that's important for them, but of course also important for us. If our neighbors are more stable, we are more secure. Okay. The two the ladies here. Uh, Natya Siskoria, I'm an associate fellow at RUSI. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Soltemirk, for your um, very useful comments. And most importantly, thank you so much for your continued support to Georgia. Yet we see that almost every single day Russia keeps violating the Georgian sovereignty. So my question to you is how likely it is that countries like Georgia and Ukraine that suffered the most from the Russian occupation may be offered uh, a membership into, the, into an, an alliance in an any for future. Thank you. So NATO decided at the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008. I was there uh, myself uh, in a different capacity. Uh, I remember we decided then uh, that uh, uh, Ukraine and Georgia will become members of uh, uh, NATO. Uh, these, uh, this decision still uh, uh, stands. At the same time, we have not put in place any exact timetable. Uh, what we focus on now uh, is how we can uh, help uh, both Georgia and Ukraine uh, uh, moving towards Euro-Atlantic integration, implementing reforms, modernizing the defense and security institutions. And, and speaking about Georgia, we have more NATO presence in Georgia now than ever before. Uh, we have a training center uh, outside Tbilisi. Uh, we had a big exercise there. Um, uh, we have political close contacts. Uh, I visited, uh, and North Atlantic also visited Tbilisi not so long ago. We actually also went to Ukraine. Um, so we are working with uh, both Georgia and uh, Ukraine, and I think it, that there is a lot between full membership and nothing. And, and what we do is that while we are helping Georgia and Ukraine moving towards NATO, we are also uh, uh, delivering uh, more cooperation. That's good for Georgia and Ukraine, but it's also good for NATO, because Georgia and, and Ukraine participate in NATO missions and operations, uh, for instance, in Afghanistan. Okay. So it's fantastic there's so many hands going up. This is truly the spirit of NATO engages, but sadly we have four minutes and 18 seconds to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Elena Melikishuli, political scientist. My question is about 2%. Uh, you say 2%. I, I think it's more quantitative measurement, and it has taken a lot of uh, attention of NATO member states, though you kind of... Uh, underestimate the importance of qualitative uh, aspects and qualitative feedback you need from your previous operations in terms of, as you said, managing difficult relations with Russia and also, as my previous uh, colleague said, uh, about active measures. So how helpful is it to talk about quantitative metrics okay. when we have qualitative problems. Okay. Thank you. Also, we, we need both. And what we agreed uh, when we made, made the pledge to invest more uh, was that we agreed to spend more and spend better. So therefore, this is part about spending more, investing more, but it's also about spending better. So we also agreed, for instance, that we should invest more in uh, research and development. Uh, we had this 20% pledge that 20% of our defense budget should be allocated for research, development, and, uh, and investments in new uh, capabilities. So we have to do both. But I think in the long run, it's obvious that you cannot, you cannot get more out of less. So we could not continue to cut. Uh, you need input to have some output. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the problem is that, of course, I agree that it is quality. It is the output that matters at the end of the day. Uh, it's harder to measure output. Uh, so therefore, I think it's important that we focus on both, uh, both on quality, but also on the need for uh, having more uh, uh, resources. And the good thing is that's, uh, that's exactly what NATO is doing now. OK, so there's a question over on this side. The hand went down. 
Just this one here, yeah. The woman with her hand up, yeah. I'm, really, Hi, um, I'm, really, really I'm a student sorry. at the University really of Sheffield. Um, I, with regards to um, emerging security threats, how important do you think the Arctic will be as a uh, setting of increasing tensions with uh, American attempted intervention, perhaps more jokingly, with Greenland, um, but also Russia's involvement with their increased presence there? Good question. Thank you. Well, the, the, imp the Arctic is, uh, the importance of Ar the Arctic is increasing uh, for several reasons. Partly because we see uh, more Russian presence up in the Arctic. Uh, we see also China is increasing their presence in the Arctic. They, they define themselves as a near Arctic country, trying to be a member of the Arctic Council. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and of course the melting of the ice uh, means also that the whole uh, geography is going to change because it will be easier to have uh, economic activity, uh, sea lines of communications uh, and so on also in the Arctic and also from, uh, from uh, the Northeast Passage uh, and actually perhaps also the Northwest Passage. So, so this is changing the whole uh, importance uh, of the Arctic. Therefore we also need to make sure that NATO is present in the Arctic and some of the investments we make in new ships, maritime capabilities, uh, surveillance capabilities but also uh, 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 aircraft uh, uh, capabilities are relevant for the Arctic. At the same time, I have always been part of this tradition where we used to say that we have the, uh, the high north and low tensions. And, and we should at least try to maintain uh, cooperation with all the Arctic states, including uh, 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 Russia, in the Arctic Council and also in the Barents uh, Sea uh, Council. So, so this, again, we have this balance between military presence but also uh, political uh, cooperation with Russia up in the Arctic. Ladies and very sorry, we only have 30 seconds left. And I think let's try to give a message to the Secretary General to bring to these very important meetings of the Alliance. At the 70th birthday, how many of you in this room are in a mood to celebrate the, the Alliance at 70? <laughs> Okay, and how many of you are coming to this birthday party of, well, a little bit worried that th some things have to change? <laughs> but okay. I would like yeah. to change. <laughs> that, yeah, NATO has okay. to change. No, but, 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 just one last word yeah. from you. I mean, if you Google NATO 70th, you'd, the words which would come up on social media would be muted celebration, dysfunctional family, fractious, uh, headaches for you, How would, what words would you use to describe this, this moment in light of the, well, the challenges and successes at your door? Uh, that NATO is the most successful alliance in history because we have always been able to change. And as long as we continue to change, we will continue to be the most successful alliance in history. So I'm extremely in favor of change. Uh, you ask pe people whether they were uh, in favor of change or in favor of celebration. Also, I'm in favor of change and celebration. Uh, and, uh, and that's the message. Happy birthday. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Thank, Thank you. the Suez crisis or the Iraq war, but we touched on all of those, and I think the interesting thing on that is the sense that the alliance has weathered more serious political crises in the past, and that's a reminder of perspective, historical perspective, that is quite interesting. The other interesting takeaway is China, and we touched on China a bit in that session. Uh, it's worth us pausing and taking stock of the fact that the communique from this uh, leaders' meeting will for the first time mention China in measured, cautious terms, but it will mention China. And I think as we look forward to future iterations of NATO engages and other NATO events, we are going to see China mentioned with more frequency uh, and the different ways it impacts on the alliance. Uh, Deborah is now going to fill us in on some of the news taking place outside of this hall.
Yes, we sort of said to you at the beginning that while this conference is taking place outside, leaders are gathering, holding bilaterals and making statements. I was interested to hear from Jens Stoltenberg about what was on the menu during his breakfast with President Trump. But you might be interested to hear what President Trump then said to the media. While the focus here is very much about alliance unity, it's important to understand and appreciate the cracks. And President Trump did launch a pretty ferocious ferocious attack on France's President Macron, taking issue with that declaration by the French President that the alliance was experienced brain death. Um, President Trump actually said that that was a very nasty statement, and he said that um, statements like that are very disrespectful, which is quite interesting coming from him, given it wasn't uh, long ago that President Trump was making pretty disrespectful remarks about NATO. So a reminder that there are a lot of issues bubbling around outside, the serve, outside while we're trying to focus inside on the real issues. Right. We can talk about those issues all day long, but we did promise you we'd have a forward-looking approach, and that's absolutely what we're going to do, and our next session exemplifies that. Um, we are going to have a presentation by model NATO students who spent yesterday running a special simulation of a natural disaster crisis and its implications for the Alliance, uh, which shows you how the next generation is thinking about some of the challenges that it, the Alliance faces. Please welcome to the stage Mark Weber, Professor of International Politics at the University of Birmingham, Capucine Guillet, a student at King's College London, and Vida Costa, a student at the University of Birmingham. Please give them a very warm welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Yesterday, a mere 500 metres from this venue at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, 90 students from 15 different UK universities, many of whom are in the audience today, came together in a model NATO crisis simulation in order to deal with an extreme natural disaster resulting in an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. This was a crisis which tested the resolve and resilience of the Alliance. I am now going to hand you over to two of the participants in the model, Capucine Guillet and Vida Costa, who will tell you how things went. Capucine. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today and a great opportunity to speak to such a distinguished audience as well. Um, as Mark said, we dealt with the catastrophic uh, natural disaster embracing an earthquake in Turkey, Romania, and Bulgaria with repercussions across the Mediterranean, notably in Italy. Unusually, these events also extended to the Mid-Atlantic because of the geo geological fault lines that lie through the Mediterranean into the Atlantic Ocean. This had Devastating consequences for the Canary Islands, involving a huge landslip into the sea, initiating a tsunami that was predicted to hit a number of littoral states of the Atlantic, both member countries and non-member countries. We were aware that NATO has some experience in uh, managing natural disasters, but the scale of the events that we had to deal with was very much beyond NATO's purview. So the main challenge for us was to configure the Alliance and decide upon priorities, aware that this crisis could not be reversed, um, but that it was one that we had to contain in order to minimize the loss of life and um, to deal with the humanitarian fallout. In the model, we did, we did this through three committees, which replicated those of the military committee, the civil emergency planning committee, and the North Atlantic Council. And for the outcome of their work, I will now hand over to Vida. Thank you, Capucine. And good afternoon to everyone. It is wonderful to be here today with you. As you've just heard, our model NATO had to deal with a disaster that was beyond any one agency's capacity to deal with on its own. However, NATO has substantial resources that it can deploy in cases of natural disasters. Despite the gravity of the crisis they were facing, I am pleased to say that our three committees demonstrated NATO's unwavering commitment to its three core tasks, 
collective defense, cooperative security, and crisis management. Framed by these three core tasks, we were able to respond to the immediate crisis points, taking into consideration both the urgent and the long-term consequences for the stability and security of the Alliance. Delegates were mindful that amidst this crisis, national interests had to be attended to, but nonetheless, they managed to find common ground and arrive at a consensus. We used all our resources of diplomacy to overcome national differences, as well as to arrive at cooperative arrangements with other international organizations, notably the European Union. So demonstrating the importance of working together in order to ensure we are prepared to overcome any challenges that might come our way in the future. The diplomatic, political, and logistical challenges of dealing with a disaster of such severity and scale was a particularly rewarding learning opportunity. I strongly believe that in order to engage the future generation of political, military, and diplomatic leaders, we need to ensure that young people have the ability to benefit from the sort of learning opportunity we were fortunate enough to experience yesterday. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage co-director of Thinking the Unthinkable, Mr. Nick Gowing. The 11th of September, 2001. Where were you that day? What do you remember when the first vivid images and the first vivid reporting came in from New York City and then Washington? I remember I was on a number 72 bus heading for BBC Television Centre about to start my presentation shift. It took on a whole new series of uh, realities. How we unpicked the chilling video. Was this a movie? Was it a Hollywood movie or something far more serious? Were unthinkables really taking place? Were they unraveling in front of our eyes in the way that many of you will remember? A member state of NATO, then 19 nations, the alliance appeared to be under attack. Uh, already horrific dimensions were unfolding before us. But on a scale unknown, how did the alliance cope? That's what we want to do in this storytelling. Was it a declaration of war by enemies unknown and unstated at that time? Should Article 5 be invoked? NATO Secretary General was Lord George Robertson, coming to the end of his second of five years as Secretary General. He, along with all the NATO ambassadors, was at the regular Tuesday informal lunch in NATO headquarters, preparing for the NATO Council the next day. One of his security detail came in and told him what was happening. For this storytelling of how NATO handles a massive crisis, here's Lord George Robertson. Hello. And welcome, thank you for being here and uh, for listening to a story. I'm, uh, as I'm constantly reminded, part of history, not part of current affairs. But that's the, uh, the fate of those of us who uh, are uh, in the political business uh, as well. So I just want to say, the, I think say 50% of this audience is under 30. So just let me uh, say to you, that I started my political career, I think 58 years ago, uh, demonstrating against the arrival of American nuclear submarines in the River Clyde in Scotland, and look where I ended up. <laughs> so that should give you hope, uh, or maybe put you off at the same time. Uh, the morning of the 11th of September 2001 was, uh, for most of us, just an ordinary Tuesday morning. The ritual in NATO is that every Tuesday the ambassadors, uh, the mighty permanent representatives to NATO, uh, meet for lunch to prepare for the following day. There's no interpreters there, it's informal, it's uh, off the record, and uh, uh, it's a free discussion takes place. 
So to have it interrupted by one of my bodyguards was something quite exceptional. And to say that uh, a building in New York had been hit uh, by an aeroplane was, was clearly a matter of some, some shock. So we thought, well, you know, accidents happen, these things happen, and we continued with our discussions. For a bodyguard to come in a second time was almost complete sacrilege, but to see a second aeroplane had hit a tower, we knew things had changed. We abandoned the lunch, we went back to NATO headquarters listening to the BBC World Service on the way we arrived there, and we, like the rest of the world, watched horrified uh, as the pictures were relayed from from New York of what was happening there as well. And I think Nick Going was actually presenting the BBC that day, so we were watching him and listening to his commentary. So the circle has come fully round as well. And then I became conscious, as we all did in the room, that we were not just onlookers. We weren't just ordinary people watching with horror and shock at what was happening on the other side of the world. We were in a military headquarters and we were on the flight path to Zamantem Airport as well. And who knew what uh, was going to happen next after what was happening uh, in New York? Uh, so we ordered that non-executive staff left the building. We convened a meeting of the ambassadors, all of the ambassadors immediately to look at the situation to and express our solidarity and shock and our horror and our sympathy with the American people at that, at that time. And then discussion started to take place. And overnight, we thought, is this the subject for Article 5? And there were people who say, come on, that's not what Article 5 was for. It was for a Soviet invasion of Europe. That's what it was meant for, not a terrorist incident in America, especially when we didn't even know whether it was domestic or from, or from foreign reaches uh, as well. Uh, but the debate went on, and I certainly said, look, this is an attack on an ally. My view is that we are going to declare Article 5. And overnight, Assistant Secretary General Edgar Buckley and my Chief of Staff, John Day, prepared a statement. The following morning, we consulted with the Americans. We consulted with some of the key allies. We had a statement there uh, in, in embryo. Uh, but still the worry, still the controversy was there. But I have to say I asserted uh, that we had to do it. I went that morning to speak to the foreign ministers of the European Union. Nobody asked the question, and we felt it would have been improper for us to raise the issue of Article 5 at that stage with them. Came back to NATO headquarters uh, and prepared the statement and got ready for the North Atlantic Council. We convened a meeting of the ambassadors at half past three in the afternoon. I said to them, there is the statement, the draft statement, Take it back to your capitals. It cannot be changed, not even by one word. And I want you back here at half past eight in the evening with the answer from each of the capitals. And I then went back to my office and I phoned up prime ministers, foreign ministers, presidents in the, in the various countries to point out the urgency and the importance of what this meant for the alliance as a whole. Now, I have to tell you that I am a politician from the west of Scotland. You know, Scottish politics, even today, is a pretty rough house. Uh, so I had to use all of my skills, uh, all of my persuasiveness, uh, in order to be able to make sure that not one of the other 18 countries in the alliance thought, postpone it for a day, change a paragraph. But at the end of the day, and remember, even in, w in one country, I spoke to the whole cabinet through the foreign minister's mobile phone. And at half past nine in the evening, we had an agreement from all 19 countries to the statement. And I then went to the press conference uh, in the NATO building, absolutely packed, and I read out that statement. And I've got a copy of it here today. I read out these words. The council agreed that if it is determined that this attack was directed from abroad against the United States, it shall be regarded as an action covered by Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which states that an armed attack against one or more of the allies in Europe or North America shall be considered an attack against all of them. So for something like 48 hours, I had been working, talking, cajoling, negotiating, arguing 
And really, it was only as I read out these words standing at that rostrum in this packed press conference that even I woke up to the significance. This mighty alliance of nations, um, years old, having been born in order to defend Europe against a potential Soviet invasion. Here it was on the 12th of September 2001, invoking Article 5, the self-defense, a component part of the Washington Treaty. And the import of that was very, very significant. Around the world, it was a signal to the American people that this alliance was standing by them at a time when they were under attack. It was a signal to the Europeans that they were on the side of America, that they were on the side of the free, ordered world, and that NATO meant business. And it was more important than all of that, probably. It was a signal to the criminal killers in the caves of the Tora Bora Mountains in Afghanistan that NATO was alive and was well and was standing by the people that they had attacked. They could hide, and they did hide, but they could not get away from this mighty alliance at this time. And I think that was such a powerful moment in, in, in the world, a powerful moment for NATO. The founding fathers of NATO were so worried about the viability of the NATO alliance and what it might mean that they actually put a break clause of 10 years into it. Wouldn't they be surprised at this birthday party today that we are now 70 years old? And here we were declaring Article 5 because one of the allies, the biggest ally, the most important ally in, in the alliance had been attacked and we were standing with them. On that day and with these words, NATO changed completely, and so did the world. NATO was in business, and the world was a better, safer place as a consequence. Thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, please join us in the lecture hall and library downstairs for lunch. Would you mind please handing your headsets in as you leave the auditorium and please rejoin us by being back in your seats by one o'clock. That's one o'clock, please, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you.